This video is long, and that's for good reason. I wanted to go very, very in-depth on this game. It's a big deal in the gaming community, and I've been saving up my thoughts on Destiny since 2014. So this is just a bigger deal for me. I've spent the best part of a month working on this so it can be relevant now and understandable to people who watch in 10 years' time. I'm going to closely inspect every aspect of the game, from the strikes to the story, from the raid to the crucible. Every topic you want to hear about will be covered in depth, but since this video is so long, I don't want to leave you with just that promise. There'll be timestamps plastered around the video and in the description so you can hear about the subjects that you want to hear about. That isn't to suggest that this video has no structure though. If you want to just get stuck in, let's get going. And before we talk about gameplay loot of the story, we've got to set the scene by taking a look at Destiny 2's new planets. As always, if you want to skip ahead, gameplay will come right after. The choice of planets in Destiny 2 is very interesting. Titan was heavily speculated and Earth was all but certain, but Nessus and Io? Those came as a surprise. No Europa, no Mercury, no Neptune. The potential of those planets is endless. I don't even think Nessus is real. Fun fact about Nessus. It's named after a centaur in Roman mythology because minor planets orbiting between Jupiter and Neptune are classified as centaurs. Pretty cool, which incidentally are the exact words I would use to describe Nessus. It looks great. The reds of flowers and trees work with the monolithic white superstructures of the Vex to create this mesmerizing contrast of colors and objects. The lushest jungles sit upon the coldest machines. It looks incredible, but don't let that fool you. Remember the Black Garden from Destiny 1? Yeah, we've already seen this as they've just turned black to white and green to red. We've also already seen the jungle versus technology theme and the Vex superstructures before on Venus. But I think Nessus is different enough for two reasons. One, people who played Destiny 1 are not the target audience for Destiny 2. Two, Venus was very constricted with the majority of the world being incredibly tight, especially around the universities, whereas Nessus is very open. Massive landscapes dominate the surface with the tight areas being kept underground. It follows the same formula as every other planet, open area into transition space into open area into transition space over and over again until you end up with something resembling a map. Then offshoots and caves are added to flesh out the world. I think the level design of these planets is actually very simple when framed like that. The most impressive part is the art and graphic designers who make it all look appealing and natural. It's clear on Nessus that we're getting more of the same. Thankfully, that same was one of the best things about the first game and it's come through unharmed for both Nessus and the European Dead Zone on Earth. The EDZ is a forest in some parts, a naturally reclaimed German town in others, and a cabal forward operating base at the top. It's far less open than Nessus, with tighter areas strung throughout and around the starting zone. Mines, houses, storefronts are all there and of course excellently designed. The open areas higher up in the zone can feel a little… empty. A little boring, I found. I'm not sure if that's just me, but I definitely feel that the Cosmodrome had a much better atmosphere. In fact, that alone makes me prefer the Cosmodrome to the EDZ by a very long stretch, and I have found an answer for why, but I'm only going to talk about that in the story segment. For now, we need to have a look at Titan. Titan is my favourite planet in the game, yet I still think Bungie failed it. From what the mission markers in the map would let on, Titan is set on a giant rig type structure, rooted in the leviathan waves of the moon's methane oceans. I've heard complaints that the water looks off here, but I think those people might have forgotten that it's not water, it's liquid methane. It's supposed to be thick. The rain, the infested skybox, the industrial theme and the waves give Titan an atmosphere like no other. I absolutely loved it. I love that they went full on tight areas for the first time ever, and then it took me into the arcology, and after seeing quite possibly the most gorgeous skybox I've ever seen, I never wanted to leave. The arcology is a giant colony type thing that's been taken over by the hive. You go through the derelict corridors seeing the futuristic type walls and fish tank looking things. I don't even know how to describe the atmosphere of this place, it's simply mind blowing. The hive infestation is believable and sold well. The arcology itself is the best golden age structure we've ever seen and the use of colour and lights is exemplary. Yet this incredible area is barely even on the map. You only go in there for one story mission, the odd adventure and one quest. Why? What the hell? Why is all the content on this rig while the best presented area Bungie have ever crafted remains an afterthought? 
I wondered why my friend said his least favourite planet was Titan after I completed that one story mission, but now I almost agree. Not only is Titan very small, even with the Arcology, the only place the game will ever want you to go is on these two small rigs. Unfortunately, Io isn't much better. It's really open and it has an incredible skybox, but it's also a Brussels sprout. Io looks awful in my opinion, it doesn't look at all like Destiny. The ridiculously large trees and sickening tones of green are much more akin to zones I'd expect from a fantasy MMO. I don't know if I'm the only one who felt this way. Something inarguable though is the contents of Io. It's just miles of road for your sparrow. There's nothing interesting in it, just canyons in the same shade of green. There's arches with nothing in or on them. There's almost no complexity to the design. Offshoots come in the form of caves and lost sectors whose placements don't at all feel natural or lost. Compare this mining excavation to this one. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear what's gone wrong here. A lack of development time. This is more than likely why IO is still at its bare bones level design. Just open areas with offshoots. They haven't had the time to come in and refine it so everything looks right and feels natural. I will admit that the Vex Pyramidian, the Odd Skeleton and Skybox look excellent, but it's not nearly enough to distract you from this solid green and occasional faded white that make IO look like a baby threw up over an entire planet. In real life, Io is the most aggressively volcanic celestial body in the entire solar system. The gravity of Jupiter and its other moons literally turns the planet inside out. So why we couldn't have seen any of that volcanism, I don't know. Io is also sulfur yellow in real life, not this greenish tint. As for the trees, the in-law explanation is that Io was the last place the Traveller ever visited. And you know, the Traveller makes everywhere it visits hospitable. Well, I don't know how it managed it, to be honest. Venus? Yeah, it's totally possible. But Io? I mean, you would need to turn off Jupiter's gravity and cool down the core of the planet. And then there's the question of how life would even form without the volcanism. It couldn't have had an atmosphere or liquid water, yet clearly some kind of life had evolved. How? Fantasy MMO. Io seems to break Destiny's internal logic. That's the biggest problem, not scientific inaccuracy. But why would Bungie have gone to such lengths to have it in the game? Aren't there tens of other places we could have gone? Well, according to concept art, this monolith built under where the Traveller once hung might be important later on. But that still doesn't explain why this couldn't have been on another planet. Regardless, that covers all four locations. I don't think they're as good as what we had in Destiny 1. No planet or moon had weak organisation or bad visuals in that game, whereas here, only two of the four honours that consistent design. It's good then that these are merely the backdrop for the meat of the game, and there's a lot to dig into, so let's begin. The reason Destiny's gameplay is held to such high praise is because it's fun. It's got no fancy mechanics, just the basic FPS combo of tools, movement and enemy design which are each refined with the laser focus of fun. Not complexity, just fun. It's a glorious combination of popping visuals, beautiful sound and perfect gunplay. Smartly designed enemies encourage some of the most aggressive FPS combat I've ever experienced along with guardian abilities and movement. The balance between the player and enemy light levels create combat that makes you feel empowered and challenged at the same time. When I say that every sensory input from your screen to your controller amplifies the experience, I mean it. That is why people stuck with Destiny, because it's a damn fine FPS. And I would say that its sequel succeeds with flying colours, yet is somehow worse than the first game in almost every way. That statement might be initially divisive, but once we've taken the magnifying glass to every aspect of the gameplay, I think you might end up agreeing. First we need to look at the most heavily modified category tools, those being the basic FPS trifecta of guns, grenades and melee with a new addition of class abilities, a buffing rift for the warlock, a barricade for the titans and a dodge for the hunters. You might think that these are all very diverse at first glance, but in reality they're all different shades of defensive abilities. Regardless of how often and when you use them, what they represent is a get out of jail free card, especially in PvE. And this will become blatantly obvious when you realise that the only time you use them is when you're taking too much damage. Warlocks can just pop a rift and heal up. Titans can make themselves some cover and heal up. Hunters can dive out of the fire and guess what? Heal up. Enemies don't encourage use of these abilities because they were never designed for that. Giving players a crutch is their primary function. But situationally, they can be used in other circumstances. The rift can be used to increase damage rather than heal, which is very useful in the raid. 
the dodge can recharge your melee which encourages more aggressive play. The rally barricade can reload your weapons. All of the abilities can be slightly more offensive, but the problem is the holy defensive variant is far more useful in almost every PvE encounter but the raid. This rings true in PvP too, it's just that the reload hunter dodge is always the best. There's nothing wrong with having a defensive ability, but what these do is make the game much easier and slower. Apart from the dodge, which just makes the game easier, by being able to go invisible on command. Yeah, Night Stalkers get life easy. Oh dear. It seems like Bungie can't help themselves from trying to add another layer to gameplay with every game they make. If it's not armor abilities, it's supers. If it's not supers, it's class abilities. Only one of those was successful, supers, because they have such a long cooldown period that they're not in use too often. I really hope they learn their lesson this time. Thankfully, the other three tools remain mostly undamaged. Guns, grenades, and melee. Let's start with the easiest first. Melee. It's unchanged from Destiny 1. A hit with the charged melee gives a buff to you or a debuff to them. Maybe it'll ramp up your mobility or give you lifesteal. Maybe it'll cause a cool chain effect. They're very fun to use, especially when you get a kill with them and make your enemies disintegrate and explode. But they're also largely insignificant for anyone who isn't an Arc Strider, Sentinel, or Gunslinger. Grenades, though, are not. In the first game, they were powerful, plentiful DPS or area denial tools. Every subclass had a wide variety, with at least one unique. Sticky grenades, seeking bolt grenades, swarm grenades, void wall grenades. They were all impressively creative, endlessly entertaining, and they all filled their role effectively. They were memorable. Very memorable in the case of the Striker Titan's lightning grenades. Very memorable. In Destiny 2, the lightning grenade is no longer overpowered. But that's because the pulse grenade is now even more overpowered and the recharge rate has been massively extended along with the damage. Grenades utterly melt, but given how long the recharge time is, you have to be very careful with throwing them. This means you get less grenades and you'll want to use them less often. Music to the ears of people sick of the ability spam meta of Destiny 1. But for PvE, I don't know if people would prefer more satisfying grenades less often than less satisfying grenades more often. I know which one I think fits the Horde style enemies better. I know which one I think makes combat faster. I know the grenades lesser presence but more of an emphasis on guns. While I prefer the faster Destiny 1 approach to grenades more than Destiny 2's, I think for PvP this was an overwhelmingly positive change. So Destiny 2 puts an increased focus on gun use in combat, and it shows it. If there's one thing I think everyone agrees on, it's that Destiny's gunplay is top notch. Sound design, art design, recoil, responsiveness, perks, all perfected to give every gun its own feel, and to make that feeling good. Guns still are that good in Destiny 2, they're still one of the combat's best features. And this time we welcome the submachine gun for close range encounters and the grenade launcher for... um... a laugh? But the biggest change is in the loadouts. Rather than primary for scouts, pulses, autos, and hand cannons, specials for snipers, shotguns, fusions, and sidearms, and power for rockets, machine guns, and swords, we now have kinetic for scouts, pulses, autos, hand cannons, sidearms, and submachine guns, energy for scouts, pulses, autos, hand cannons, sidearms, and submachine guns, and power for snipers, shotguns, fusions, linear fusions, grenade launchers, rockets, and swords. Yeah, Kinetic and Energy have the same gun types, but Kinetic focuses on damage while Energy has the elemental effect, which works better on shields. And that's it. Essentially, you have two primaries and one power, and I'm sure the first problem with this system has already become apparent. If we've got two slots that both have the same types, then you'll be seeing those types far more often, and the types relegated to power slots like snipers and shotguns far less often. So there's less weapon diversity, but that also affects playstyle. Snipers, shotguns, and fusions represented extremes. A shotgun or fusion are very close range weapons, and a sniper is a very long range weapon. You make their use rarer, playstyles will follow suit. There's no more shotgun rampaging, no more 360 quickscoping, because those guns that encourage a very specific kind of play are so much rarer. Pretty much every kind of fun gun is now in the power slot. If your bread and butter combat is going to be using simple, reliable primary weapons that are only meant to be optimized for their specified ranges, your playstyle is going to become far less specialized. Scouts are long range, pulses are long mid, autos are mid, hand cannons are mid to short, subs are short, and sidearms are short. This is the only variation you've got. Only sidearms and submachine guns need to be short range to work. With every other variant, you can still operate at every range. There's so little encouragement to ever change the way you look at encounters. Combine that with slower ability recharge and a new defensive ability, it's pretty obvious that Bungie wants Destiny 2 to be a slower game. 
Why? I can only guess that the answer is Crucible, because this is the only mode that benefits from the double primaries. Specials could one-shot their effective ranges, now the majority of guns cannot, making PvP that much more competitive. It's also the only mode that clearly benefits from slower grenade and melee. It means gun scale is usually the deciding factor in engagements over ability spam. Class abilities actually add depth instead because everyone gets them and they can be very easily counted. This seems very curious to me, because every change in the player's tools is either neutral or negative in PvE, but always positive in PvP. Which begs the question, was PvP more of a focus than PvE in Destiny 2? If yes, why was it decided that PvP and PvE should maintain its gameplay uniformity over simply developing both modes separately so they could both be the best that they could be? Why couldn't we have had these changes only in PvP and not PvE? I don't quite understand, and unfortunately Destiny 2 isn't saved by the other two corners of FPS combat, movement and enemy design. These two categories aren't any worse than Destiny 1, they're just the same. So they're still very, very good, just not improved enough to cancel out the regressions in the player's arsenal, or to justify Destiny 2 being a sequel. Once again, movement feels unique to all three classes, liberating, fast, simple and fun. It somehow manages to make jumping puzzles fun in an FPS, imagine that. Enemy design is also very good, large enough in numbers and small enough in health pool to make the player feel empowered. Each enemy type and affection has its own defining trait, so you do have to play slightly differently depending on what type of enemy you're fighting. You should back away from the rushing thralls and knights. You have to prioritise taking out taken scions before they multiply. You have to check every direction for invisible marauders and wretches. Cabal now have slightly different phalanxes, as in they can now deploy their shields. War beasts, incendiors, and a blinding missile attack also join the Empire, which do add a nice extra layer. Every enemy type has its own trait, but those rarely encourage any response from the player other than, oh, I should target this one first. It's only the rushing thralls and knights and war beasts that ever ask the player to become more defensive. It's only the invisible fallen that encourage increased alertness. Let's use the Taken as an example. The Scions multiply, so you should rush them down before their numbers grow too high. The Vandals have a bubble shield that can protect other Taken, so you should rush them down before they do that. The Wizards can spawn hordes of Shadow Thralls, so you rush them. The Centurions shoot tracking explosions. Guess what? You rush them. They've all got cool abilities, but the only thing that means for the player is I should play more aggressive. Looking at the Vex, Hive, Cabal, and Fallen, Apart from in select circumstances, a similar effect is true. Hydras and phalanxes have shields, get behind or above them. Hobgoblins, gotta rush them before they snipe you. Servitors, you actually do need to rush them. The only change Bungie makes in enemy design to attempt to slow down the player is the Cabal Incendiors. They explode if you get a kill shot on their backs and have ridiculous damage output up close, so you do need to be defensive around these guys. But other than that, these five factions are still very well optimized for aggressive play. They're meant to make the player feel badass, because it's fun. But the changes to players' tools encourage a more defensive style of play. I think there's a very clear conflict in design, and that's very noticeable for someone who plays Destiny 1. They've slowed the player down in direct conflict with the enemies you're meant to fight. You either encourage defensive play in your enemy design, or you don't make the player more defensive. But somehow, this isn't the biggest problem with enemies, because much of what I described above doesn't actually matter in the vast majority of activities. You see, those taken abilities are only going to encourage aggressive play if the player perceives them as a threat, otherwise the player won't care. There are two ways this can go. Too hard, and the only viable tactic is to hide behind a wall and pick things off. Super defensive, not fun at all. Too easy, and every tactic is viable, but the player won't want to use any of them. They'll just mope around slaughtering enemies thoughtlessly. You've got to get the difficulty right, and Destiny 2 is too easy. Moping around slaughtering everything is actually how I would describe the single player campaign. So I suppose now it's time to chime in in the difficulty controversy of games journalism. External skill does exist. Some players are better than others. It comes down to how much experience they have with other games in the same genre, other games in the same franchise. And guess what Destiny 2 is? Yeah, a sequel. Its primary audience, despite Bungie's best efforts, is going to be fans of Destiny 1, who are used to Destiny gameplay, who are probably very good at it and want something to challenge them. Destiny 2 does not provide this. It's insanely easy, and that is of course to appeal to the new audience who've come along after marketing and promises of a quicker grind. It's very simple. Increase accessibility, because the more accessible you are, the wider your audience. The wider your audience, the more money you make. 
It's not an act of evil, it's an act of business. Destiny 2's target audience is undeniably these new players who weren't convinced by the first. That will become blindingly obvious as we go on. Yet, it is a sequel. Its name is Destiny 2. It is not unreasonable for Destiny vets to expect a sequel level of changes and difficulty increases with new mechanics, enemies, and abilities. This is why Destiny 2 is too easy, because A, it's an FPS, and this is a very easy FPS, and B, it's a Destiny game, and this is miles easier than the first. But Dark Souls 2 was easier than Dark Souls 1, and nobody complained, so what gives? Dark Souls 2 was easier in hindsight. Once you had played the game and beaten the bosses, yeah, it was easier. But Dark Souls 2 was different from 1. It has new healing mechanics, new level design, new enemy design, new weapons, new spells, new systems, mechanics, that meant regardless of how good you were at Dark Souls 1, there was still something new to learn and master in 2. Not everybody liked those systems, but they were there and they were new, which meant no one found the game a cakewalk, and it could still appeal to both audiences. Destiny 2 is more of the same, and that's a problem only amplified by the fact that you could describe the original Destiny with that exact sentence. More of the same. The same three-wave cop-out mission repeated 20 times. In that, it's more than clear to me that this game was not for the hardcore fans, and the only reason I'm bitching about that is because it stands as a sequel rather than a reboot. This dogmatic attempt to appeal to the casual audience in gaming permeates not just the gameplay, but the most important aspect of Destiny, the loot and the progression. In the last section, I explained that I thought Destiny 2 wasn't intended for fans of the first game, but people new to the series. Even people new to first-person shooters. Well, I'm going to make that point crystal clear in this section. Aside from the fact that Destiny 2 is effectively a hard reboot for everyone, regardless of your characters in the first game, the most obvious example of this is in the subclasses. After the first mission when Gaul and the Space Turtles take your light, you only even get the ability to do anything but shoot and jump a couple missions in. You go into some haunted woods and touch a corrupted shard of the Traveller, which somehow makes you a Guardian again. You might think this is ridiculously quick given the premise of the game, but it's ridiculously long given that it's a Destiny sequel. Design decisions made to satisfy a target audience that doesn't include me are not valid criticism though. I don't think Bungie was wrong to do this, I think they were wrong to do this with Destiny 2. The nature of subclasses themselves have undergone changes obeying the same philosophy. They're far more refined this time round. Well, at least compared to the first game. And those refinements don't just include cutting down your choices and removing useless perks, but also editing the roster as a whole. Destiny 2 has two new subclasses. Well, 1.5, which is kind of ironic. We're ignoring the Fist of Panic, but with facilities for multiple panics. There's the Arc Strider for Hunters, which is essentially the Blade Dancer but cooler, and the Sentinel, which is the Defender but also maybe Captain America. That's the point five, since there's new abilities, but the subclass is just an adaptation of their previous iterations. And then there's the Dawnblade. With new abilities and a really cool new super, it quickly became my favourite subclass in the entire game, but I main Warlock, so that's just me. For everyone else, there's very little on top. An ability here, a buff there. And did there need to be? Bungie had the balance down in Destiny 1, and Destiny 2 is meant to appeal to an entirely new audience. Destiny veterans who had already broken in those subclasses are the minority. For the new audience, these subclasses feel as different as they felt in 2014 when no one had played Destiny before. I do think it's disappointing, but I grudgingly understand. Subclasses are also divided into two skill trees now, rather than a big old mix and match. There's trade-offs to each one in pretty much every subclass. Dawnblade is a good example. Do you want your super to last forever and track your enemies, or do you want to be able to shoot while gliding an Icarus dash every 10 seconds? Here, this two-choice system works excellently. They both give the subclass a different feel, and they're both very well balanced. So you'll want to switch and play with both. Coming over to the Stormcaller, it doesn't fare as well. On one side, you've got Landfall, a small AoE on super activation, a conditional recharge rate on your buff, a conditional recharge rate buff on your Rift, Rising Storm, which increases recharge rates when you use the charged melee, and Arc Soul, which gives you a little arc buddy to help you out in your rifts. I doubt my description sold it, but this attunement is kind of awful. You get recharge rate buffs, a lackluster version of Landfall, and an Arc Soul, which is only useful in the raid. Compare that to getting Chain Lightning on melee, Chain Lightning on grenades, being able to teleport in Storm Trance, and getting a longer storm trance if your grenade and melee is full. While the last one is unlikely unless you've got the crown of tempests, the other three are practical and not just minor buffs. It's awful balancing. In the case of Striker Titan though, it's borderline slapstick. 
On one hand, you've got a buff to stability after melee, a buff to health regen after a melee kill, a slight, conditional increase to melee range, and an extension of the Fist of Havoc if you get kills with it. Not very impressive, and that's without considering choice two. There's the Seismic Strike, which is just the shoulder charge from Destiny 1. Incredibly fun and useful. Aftershock, which lowers grenade cooldown when you use the shoulder charge. Magnitude, which not only extends the duration of pulse and lightning grenades, the two best grenades in the game, but you also get two of them. Jesus Christ, that could be an attunement on its own. And then, to top it all off, you get Terminal Velocity, which buffs your air to surface slam, and gives it a lasting area of denial effect afterwards. I don't quite understand how the balancing could get this bad. While I like the idea of streamlining and having these cool attunements, in cases like this, you only get one choice. Compared to the Taken King subclasses, which has loads of choices and combinations, many of which were well balanced, despite the UI being a mess. So how many subclasses are balanced, and how many are awful? Well, Gunslinger, Night Stalker, Sentinel, Dawnblade, and Voidwalker are fine. But Arkstrider, Sunbreaker, Stormcaller, and Striker are not. And I'm not sure about Sentinel. This is a pretty awful split. I definitely think some major rebalancing needs to come into play. But you can at least attribute these balancing issues to the fact we're still very early after release. You can't do the same though when considering why getting these new subclasses is nothing compared to The Taken King, an expansion that came out two years ago. In that game, you'd have to complete a quest and do challenges to work your way up to the final mission, which despite reusing Crucible maps was one of the most atmospheric and empowering experiences I had ever seen. Stormcaller especially. Here you get a random loot drop that starts your quest, which in its entirety is just kill some enemies. That's it. Once that's done, you do a shooting gallery mission, which is alright, but it wastes the cool little lore projection things because the majority of people don't care, won't understand, or just skip them. I like that they were there, I just don't think they should have replaced actual gameplay. It's nothing compared to the last game, and that had such a tiny team and budget that they literally used multiplayer maps to set them on. This confusion is common when talking about Destiny 2's progression. But before we get into the rest of that, we have to talk about the initial 8 hours of power progression. Yeah, it's power now, not light, but I don't think anyone cares, it's still light. Once again, the stats of your weapons and armor are average to decide your character's light level. This controls how much damage you take and dish out. It's pretty simple MMO leveling, but decided almost entirely by gear. Traditional levels still do exist, up to 20, but they only serve to pace content. So let's look at that. After you've got your light back, you want to take your first mission in the EDZ, where you talk to the most ridiculous stereotype I've ever seen in all my time gaming. Basically shows you the ropes of the new exploration in Destiny 2, which is where the bulk of the side content lies. Rather than awful patrol missions, you now have adventures and lost sectors. Adventures are side missions. It's as simple as that. You go up to one, accept it, you get some dialogue explaining the situation, and you shoot some stuff. That may sound generic, but these little things actually impress me. Aside from the excellent voice acting and entertaining dialogue you'll get throughout, every single one I did had something to make it memorable. Perhaps it was just that dialogue. Perhaps it was a creative boss fight. I assumed that these adventures would be cookie-cutter rubbish akin to the patrols of Destiny 1, but shockingly, almost every adventure of the 29 total is better than the vanilla story content in the first game. The amount of work that went into making every single one interesting in some way must have been astounding, and there's 29 of them. None of them are great, but almost all are firmly entertaining. This is worthwhile content. Looking over to the Lost Sectors, the other half of these improved patrols, we've got a similar story. Lost Sectors are essentially hidden areas in the world that contain a huge combat arena at the end. There'll be a boss and a chest. Kill the boss to open the chest and you're done. If you've ever played Skyrim, imagine one of the caves in that game. By far, the most impressive things about these sectors is the design. Somehow, every single one of the 27 manages to look utterly astounding. I don't know what the art designers were smoking in the development of this game, but these are some of the most impressive visuals and side content in any video game ever. That, and the fairly complex level design, just enhances the generally fun combat encounters you'll get here. Lost Sectors are not without fault though. 27 may seem like a big number, but it'll seem a lot smaller once you've realised that there are 16 on Earth and only 6 shared between Titan and Io. It's very clear to me that impressions are Bungie's weapon here. The majority of adventures are on Earth too. Now, there's still a lot of them, there's just not enough on the other planets. Why no lost sectors in the Arcology? Why are there only three on Io? I think far more of the designer's time should have been on these other worlds. And we also have to consider the name. They're not really lost sectors. They're sectors. You would need to be visually impaired to miss most of these caves. This is my biggest criticism with the system, because it's not really exploration if there's a giant marker pointing in only one possible direction. It heavily detracts from the believability too. 
which I think further weakens the planet design in Destiny 2. But as a whole, the content itself is there, and it's also the only side content you'll have throughout the first two acts of the campaign. It's just them and story missions until you've brought Cade, Zavala and Ikora back into the fold, and this is more than enough to keep the player satisfied. I would even call it expert. Level requirements shift between story missions just enough so that you'll need to go and do some patrol content to even the gap. Since they both drop a few pieces of gear just above your light level, you'll make steady increases, along with the accumulation of tokens. Each planet has a vendor who gives you a legendary engram filled with planet-specific guns and gear for every 20 tokens you accumulate. The loot is well-themed and certainly tempting, but you can't actually do anything until you hit level 20, which the vast majority of people will do after the campaign ends. Why doesn't he just give you greens and blues until then? Then, I don't know. As it is, the token system is meaningless and almost misleading. Regardless, you'll have done at least 10 adventures and lost sectors by Act 2's close, which paces those missions excellently. Sometimes you'll just want to do them even if the next story mission is ready, because the campaign takes you to each planet so quickly. Only three missions on each one. They'll continue pacing even after Act 2 ends, but they'll likely be overshadowed by the next major introduction of content. Zvala introduces strikes, Ikora introduces challenges, and Cade introduces patrols and flashpoints. At this point, the transition phase and your power progression begins. You have all this new content and you can do whatever you please to level up, but the game is banking on you going straight for the story. Because after you've done that, you get to go to the new tower and receive a sparrow and new ship. Yeah, it's only after the story finishes that you can get a sparrow. Why? The reason is simple. To pad out the game by making you walk everywhere and to encourage exploration. The Sparrow is what convinces me that Act 3 is meant to be a transition. That's why there are so many vehicle sections at this point in the campaign. Because every single one of the new activities encourage fast traversal, and the exploration activities encourage the opposite. This is why the Sparrow is held back until now. They don't want you speeding past all the exploration side content, ignoring all the little details. And Act 3 is the transition. You're taking back the last city, going back to the tower, getting all these new activities piled on you that seem like they'd take forever. It's supposed to feel like a natural transition from one set of content into the other, and it succeeds. After you're at the tower, you've got new adventures, patrols, quests, and all of those new things I listed above to get your light level to 265. This is the second phase of progression. It's a lot of content to deal with for the player, but the milestones in the director and big icons everywhere make it easy enough to understand. Light recommendations are also used to guide you away from adventures and lost sectors and into the new stuff, despite the fact that you still get the same loot regardless. So, challenges. These are pretty simple. Every day a set of three challenges will appear in every activity you do. Each one grants two tokens. On planets they're barely worth doing since you can loot region chests and do patrol content for tokens at a far higher rate. But if the challenge is easy and you can kill two birds with one stone, it's free tokens. The planet engrams are available and give highlight loot so tokens do matter at this point in the game. There's also a daily challenge milestone that gives Ikora tokens. It just asks you to do three challenges in any given activity. You'll need to do this milestone three times before you get an Ikora engram though, which really isn't worth going out of your way to do. You get the starting gear but a high light, which is nice, but it's really not worth the time, even with Ikora's new meditations. Every week she allows you to replay the story missions. You get her rep for doing so, and that's it. It's a massive waste of time as the system stands. Ikora needs to give far, far more tokens for doing one of these. Why do they relegate the replay mission function to this? This is no replacement for the daily heroic. Challenges and all Ikora stuff is really disappointing, but Cade is even worse. He's got patrols and flashpoints. Patrols, you ask? Yeah, they're those basic, awful, MMO-style crap we had in Destiny 1. You get tokens, but there is no reason to do any of these over the exploration content. I don't even know why they exist. Maybe if Bungie spruced them up a little like they did with Rise of Iron, but they didn't. So they're awful, but what about flashpoints? Well, every week a planet becomes the flashpoint. What does that mean? Some powerful reskinned enemies spawn. Wow. Other than that, you get a luminous engram, which gives very high light gear once you've done enough public events. Yeah, pubs are back and they're a lot better. There's a wider variety of them, and with a good team effort you can make them heroic by doing a task like shooting glimmer extractors or depositing arc charges. The event gets much harder if you do this, but it also drops better loot. A good chance of exotics too, which believe me, we'll talk about in depth. So the pubs are good, but the flashpoint is just farming. It sucks. After you've done a flashpoint or two, you'll have done enough public events for the magic to wear off. All that's left then is strikes. This is a big topic. Strikes are 20 minute battles against an enemy faction and a specific boss who's usually set up through dialogue or scripted events. You'll be fighting through hordes of enemies, mini bosses, and maybe even some stuff that doesn't involve shooting until you reach the final boss, which is always unique and memorable due to some cool mechanic. 
Some strikes are set in entirely new zones, while some only have the boss room originally made. Regardless, strikes are, as Zavala says, the backbone of PvE content. They certainly were in Destiny 1, but here you might not know it. It's only when you talk to Zavala once at the farm that they're even brought up. After that, they're relegated to a blue circle for the rest of the game. Why? These strikes are almost always Destiny's best content beside the raid. Who doesn't remember the Darkblade, or the Shield Brothers, or Tanix, or even the Devil's Lair? And they were certainly presented that way in the first game, so either this is just weird decision making, or Bungie have something to hide. I'd say it's a mix of both, but definitely more the first than the second. Every strike is solid, they've all got a good premise, a cool boss fight, and a bunch of combat. Some even have extra mechanics like the void light bulbs in Savathun's song, which we've seen before, and the beams of light which you have to dodge in the Pyramidian. Perhaps it isn't a coincidence that Savathun's song and the Pyramidian are the only two strikes that I think are good. They've both got their weaknesses, but what was important was the atmosphere. Savathun's song tells a story about fire teams going missing on Titan. You go into the Arcology and find that the Hive have locked off one of the doors with runes which raises suspicions. You continue through and find weird shards of light which apparently can only come from Guardians. You hear someone fighting off the Hive and then silence. The next room has one of those crystals. It becomes clear here that the Hive are turning Guardians into Void Energy as part of a ritual to summon Savathun, a character only lore buffs will know. There's a pretty good horror vibe and it really makes the strike memorable. It tells a story and it tells it well along with solid combat. The boss here is just a giant shrieker, but it teleports around and at one point you have to jump a huge gap with a ball of light in hand and smash it down, which feels really cool. I wish the boss wasn't a shrieker, but it was, again, memorable. In the case of the Pyramidian, it's much more the combat and visuals than the story that makes it great. You're going to this giant vex structure akin to the Vault of Glass, but without the time travel stuff. It looks incredible, but what's even better is the genuinely challenging combat. There's so many enemies, both the Taken and the Vex, who each require slightly different approaches to beat. Again, only slightly, but given the good level of challenge, the difference shines bright. You have to run through rotating laser grids later on, which again is actually quite difficult the first time through. Then, to top it all off, you dive through a cool Vex hole thing into the boss arena. It's a giant hobgoblin, yes, but it's got some cool mechanics. First phase has it teleporting into cage things, so you have to stand on plates to bring it down and do damage. After you've done that twice, you can go all out on it, but it's going to summon hordes of Vex to back it up and mix around the cover. It'll remove cover right in front of you, so if you don't stay on your toes, you're pretty much dead. It's a great fight, giant hobgoblin or not. We've had one strike elevated by the story, and another by its combat. Looking back to the Taken King, we commonly saw both. That isn't to say Destiny didn't have its weak strikes, but shockingly, I don't even think those ever got as bad as the worst of Destiny 2. The arms dealer has you chasing around some big green cabal asshole through the same cabal base design we've seen a million times before on the campaign. The mini boss is a goliath tank, which isn't too bad even if its reuse at this point is slightly sickening. But then after that, you have to fight the exact same tank on the most irritating arena in Destiny history. They make a quick joke of it, which just makes me even more upset. Then, once you get to the boss, it's just a normal big-ass cabal whose special mechanic is teleporting into a shield, forcing you to kill a bunch of adds before you can damage him again. It's like the Hobgoblin boss, but without the fun. Then there's the Exodus Crash Strike, whose main mechanic is walking into beams of light in areas you've already been. I think the boss room is the only new area. These strikes are just bad, but the Inverted Spire is the most disappointing. It takes you through incredible battlescapes and a giant mining operation with the drills you have to dodge. It looks great. The problem is, you can skip almost all of it. On this giant battlefield, you only need to kill two guys. The giant drill? Yeah, it's a fun little obstacle course until you realise there's a path right there that you can take to walk past the entire encounter. The boss is great, but there's supposed to be an entire strike, not just a boss fight. This entire strike system is a massive disappointment. There's only five if you're not on PlayStation. You can't pick which one you want to do, and if you're wondering about loot, you get capped at 265 blues, maybe a legendary and some tokens to give to Zavala for some lacklustre guns. Nameless Midnight and Nightshade are great, but they're really not worth farming these strikes for. Man. Well, strikes don't end there. There's still the Nightfall to discuss. Nightfalls in Destiny 2 work similar to Destiny 1. They're weekly strikes, but with some modifiers and much stronger enemies. Modifiers range from no ammo dropping for your currently equipped weapon, to the player health pool being hugely extended, but no recharge. 
As far as I can tell, all those modifiers return except for the burns. Those just increase damage from one type of energy across the board, arc, solar, or void. Players would then equip the appropriate subclass and weapons and learn to avoid enemies who use that kind of energy. Sometimes this would make the nightfall ridiculously easy if little to no enemies were using the burn, players would essentially just have a massive damage buff with no trade-offs. Back when the Galahorn was at the top tier, you could melt bosses in seconds on solar burn, but they also made some nightfalls way too hard. Shield Brothers on Solar Burn was hell on Saturn. The brothers would jump at players, sending out waves of energy which would one-shot them. All the Cabal infantry also had solar firing weapons. So the system was flawed, but Bungie didn't do anything about it until now, with Destiny 2's rotating burns. Now, burns will change every 30 seconds or so, meaning you need to prioritize energy diversity and stay alert for the next switch. But above all, this means nightfalls with burns are no longer too easy or too hard. A great change in my opinion. But the burn modifier is far rarer than Destiny 1. Now, it's no more common than other modifiers like increased ability recharge rate. I think this makes Nightfalls a lot less complex. But Bungie attempts to compensate for that with a new time-based modifier which replaces burns as the modifier common to all Nightfalls. Every Nightfall has a timer. If it runs out, you fail. For the majority of Nightfalls, you can extend the timer with anomalies which you shoot or rings which you jump through. There's always enough of these to get you through the Nightfall comfortably, but you will need to get all of them to be safe. And I don't think jumping through hoops or shooting anomalies is particularly interesting. It doesn't add to the gameplay, it's just busy work so you don't get kicked back to orbit. And even with full time, anything you can skip you pretty much need to, apart from in select circumstances. Skipping as much as possible is not only easy on strikes like the Inverted Spire, it's encouraged by this timer. You'll be riding your sparrow through almost the entire thing, and as a result, Nightfalls don't feel like they're challenging your skill, but rather your speed which defeats the point of strikes in the first place. I don't understand how Bungie could have, after screwing up one game's Nightfalls with a poorly thought out modifier, then screw up the next game's Nightfalls with a poorly thought out modifier. As for loot, you get a luminous engram and a bunch of tokens, which I think is more than adequate. But much like Destiny 1, the loot's good, but getting it is not. Well, to be more accurate, the light level on the loot is good. Loot as a whole is one of Destiny 2's greatest issues. The problem is the variety and creativity on display. Greens is supposed to be kinda dull, kinda boring. And then blues are supposed to look a little better, and then legendaries which are supposed to look cool, and exotics which are meant to be just that. Exotic. Well, greens look rubbish, and exotics look, mm, for the most part, exotic. They got that right. But for the majority of the game you'll be wearing blues and legendaries. Blue grind starts near the end of the campaign and stops at 265. At this time you'll be wearing mostly them. And the problem with this is all down to variety. There are two sets of blue armor in Destiny 2 for each class, maybe three. Which means every time you get a blue drop, it's more than likely going to be something that you've already gotten a thousand times before or are already wearing. This can be very frustrating and flat out boring for the duration of the blue grind. Then, when you move up into majority purples, you'll begin to realize that there's tons of variety, but what there is is just not up to par. My experience is primarily with the Warlock, and I can say that the Philomath and the high-minded complex sets look utterly gorgeous. But everything else? Most of it's just fine. But the Dead Orbit, Io, EDZ, Arcology, Nessus, and Tesseract Trace are all ghastly. The Hero Camo and the Xenos Veil look suspiciously similar. The new Monarchy Robes are just a reskinned Philomath, and the Crucible set, the Anchor Seeker, is just a reskinned high-minded complex. The real problem here is mundane designs. Can anyone really say they'd wear this? over this. What happened to that incredible helmet from Destiny 1? What happened to most of the good designs from Destiny 1? We would have preferred good, reused armors to bad new ones. And if you thought Warlocks had it bad, take a moment of silence for the Hunters, please. They've gone from ragtag bandits to cosplaying parkour instructors. Toe shoes? Seriously? What is this helmet? Why are the Road Complex gauntlets so bland? Because Bungie thought this would offend people? What is this supposed to be? Kek? You removed a design because it resembles a 4chan meme. I thought they seriously screwed up when I saw all the articles about Nazi armor pieces, but this is just insanity. Even if it said establish the new world order on it, I'd still prefer it to a perfectly grey piece of plastic and some sheared off piece of metal that they glued onto the forearm. The situation isn't terrible, but it isn't good. And what is terrible is that it's worse than what we had in Destiny 1, especially since shaders are now one-time use and you're going to be using them on these ugly ass armor sets. They wouldn't do that purposefully, so you had to rely on shaders more often now, would they? Probably not. Customizing individual armor pieces is great, except why would you ever want to? I don't know. 
I don't think it's so people can express their creativity by making their guardians look disgusting. I think it's actually because that gives Bungie an excuse to split up the shaders into four parts. So now you need one for each piece, meaning they can give you only two or three shaders per drop, despite the fact that you need four for the set. Yeah, it's all very obviously about Eververse. You get all these shaders and cosmetic crap from Tess by decrypting bright engrams, which you get from leveling up after 20, and silver, the virtual currency. Engrams are of course loot boxes in this case, and they're the only way to get exotic sparrows, legendary sparrows, exotic ships, legendary ships, every good looking shader, including both golds and true black and white, every emote, exotic emotes, exotic ornaments, and if that wasn't enough, transmit effects. The exotic sparrows and ships are an absolute kick in the teeth for Destiny 1 players, who are constantly teased with the Dawn Chaser Sparrow, the first exotic vehicle. We were excited for the quests we'd have to do to get them, and what we got was a paywall. No, the leveling bright engrams is not enough. You have a minuscule chance of getting anything good, and most of the ships, while legendary, are not that impressive. It doesn't help that Tess Everest is a cheeky bastard whose escape from the tower is both insulting in law and as a business practice. But it doesn't end there. You can also get mods and RNG boosters from Tess, both of which of course have in-game effects, and you can only get the RNG booster from Tess. This is a step over the line, and I think it might be one of the first times that gamers really made it apart from EA's sports games. It probably explains why the mod system is so shallow and boring with an awful UI and the most unimaginative, lackluster mod effect imaginable. I have doubts it was ever intended as anything more than a test from Activision. Destiny 2 is guaranteed to sell in troves, their marketing campaign ensured it. And so they decided to use the game as a trial to see how far they could push in-game microtransactions, to see if anyone would notice or care that they were starting to have serious in-game effects. And as it is with all forms of conditioning, as long as you introduce it slow enough, people will just start to accept it. It's not pay to win yet, but that is no saving grace in a $60 game. Eververse in Destiny 2 is nothing short of disgusting, and is absolutely the worst thing about the game's progression. The system has flown under the radar of the Destiny community to a frankly shocking degree. And I don't think that's their fault. I think Bungo and Crap Division got away with it because all these exotic ornaments and sparrows and ships aren't very enticing. There's nothing on them that justifies the yellow backgrounds. And the ornaments may be alright, but the guns they go on are not. It's now time for the rant of all rants. I hate exotics in Destiny 2. Exotics have always been the highlight of the loot system. The most desirable, most unique, most powerful weapons and armour. Everything about them was designed to be what they're labelled as. Exotic. That word also suggests a degree of rarity. In you one of the first game, I think most would say they were a little too rare, but I wouldn't. Exotics were rare, and that only made getting them that much sweeter. I think any Destiny 1 player would agree that getting their first exotic was an experience to remember. There's enough Galahorn reaction compilations on YouTube to fill Satan's iPod for the next 2,000 years. Rarity is far from the only thing that made these exotics special. It's actually just a single factor combined with how damn cool these things were. The Thorn. The Hawkmoon, the last word, these are guns that I will never forget. I will never forget how good they looked, how different they made you play, how unique and interesting their perks were. The aggression and style of the last word, the reliability and power of the Hawkmoon, the cancer of the thorn. I can't imagine the amount of work that went into making using exotic weapons as much of a high as getting them. Armor was great too, who could forget the Mask of the Third Man, the Heart of the Praxic Fire, the Twilight Garrison. These would never change your play as much as weapons would, and were pretty poorly balanced, but they still felt exotic for the most part. And a lot of the magic of these exotics came from the fact that not everyone had them one week in. Even hardcore players would only have a couple. They were an elusive motivator to keep playing, to grind. But a lot of people didn't like grinding a Destiny, and there were two implementations to combat that. First was there from the beginning. Zier was a vendor who would only show up from Friday through Saturday, and he brought a random selection of exotics and other goodies that you could buy with strange coins. Other than him, the Taken King brought the three of coins. Buy these and you could skyrocket your chances of an exotic dropping. The result? The rarity of exotics just went. I think generally people were happier with this system, but it did trade off a lot of the exoticness of exotics. Destiny 2 removes the three of coins because it basically hands out exotics like they're birth control pills in China. And the exotics themselves are also awful. That doesn't help either. So I suppose we should start with the former. You get a choice of three exotics in the campaign twice over. And the choice of weapons is insanely difficult and offensive because these three guns are some of, if not the coolest looking in the game. 
You also get exotics from public events and Crucible quite often. I'd put the drop rate at anywhere from 1 in 10 to 1 in 20, but that was enough to get me a boatload of exotics over my playtime. I didn't really care that much while playing because these exotics are just bad. The Sunshot, Vigilance Wing, Wardcliffe Coil and Sweet Business are the only ones worth remembering. Designs are lackluster, perks are often useless. Balancing is even worse. Merciless and Wardcliffe Coil are the only exotics with notable power. Borealis, Sunshot and Sweet Business are also pretty good. Cold Heart is only good for the raid. Other than that, a legendary will be better than an exotic in almost every circumstance. The creativity in perks is almost there, it's just that the perks aren't effective enough. Take Grisk Runner. It's got a perk that lets it translate all incoming arc damage into outgoing arc damage through the gun. It feels cool, looks cool, but it's not very good. You need circumstances to be just perfect for it to make a difference. If the perks were at all pronounced, you would have to change up your playstyle to make use of them as you did in Destiny 1. Now you would rarely, if ever, sacrifice Merciless for anything else. Even if Bungie didn't want exotics to be more powerful than legendaries this time, they failed at that too. Maybe four exotics are better than legendaries, the rest are worse. As for armor, it's a mixed bag. You've got stuff like the Crown of Tempest, which is one of the best looking helmets I've ever seen in a video game. It allows you to go absolutely mental with the Stormcaller. But there's also crap like the Electro Fishbowl, whose effect I still haven't noticed. Or the ACDC fence thing. You get melee kills with it, and then when you get meleeed, you do 14 damage. 14 damage. If the game simulated individual breaths, Breathing on a shank would do more damage than that. The Mechanist Trick Sleeves look awful and marginally buff sidearm ready and reload speed. That's it. It's comedic. Armor is plentiful thanks to reusing stuff from the first game, and I think far fewer armor pieces are useless than weapons. But given the amount of them, I think that acquisition is spread out enough for it not to be a huge deal. Unfortunately, it gets much worse. Exotic quests exist in Destiny 2 like they did in Destiny 1. I wish they didn't. You get each one for completing quests that pop up after you get to the tower, one on each planet. So only four, but that's a mercy because these are just repetitive combat sections akin to the first game. The Titan quest is alright because you feel like you're playing a game like battle against a fallen captain, but that's the only thing of note. The exotic quests that come after are even worse. Not only did they choose some of the worst exotics in the game to have quests, the quests are also awful. Stuff no more complex than vanguard bounties like shoot x amount of y in z pointless way or dismantle 10 rare scouts. Getting them done is boring and somehow worse than what we had in Destiny 1. Even the lackluster rubbish we had in year 1 had a super hard version of a strike to get the thorn. Here we've got a ridiculously easy version of the worst strike in the game to kill Kendrick Lamar which doesn't even happen in the boss room but in the area before. Why? In Rise of Iron, you had to do actual missions to get the Galahorn. Really fun missions, reused Crucible maps or not. How have they managed to regress from reused Crucible maps? Exotics themselves are bad too. You get the Sturm, which is useless because it's a thousand times worse than the Better Devils or Sunshot. There's the Mida Multi-Tool, which is so good that it's made Crucible a nightmare. According to Bungie, there are better weapons out there, but as long as High Caliber Rounds is as good as it is, there really aren't. Yet this gun is an exotic quest, which is available to everyone and also insanely easy. And then there's the Rat King. It's got a really creative perk. The more Rat King users there are in a radius, the better the gun. It stacks six times, and since you can only have six people in the raid, you'd expect it to be great. No, it's useless. There are no buffs to damage, just fire rate, magazine size, and reload speed. So its ammo consumption, range, and actual damage still suck. This entire exotic system is just depressing. Armor is okay, but weapons and quests are largely awful. Every single aspect that made those yellow gems exotic has been systematically removed. Exotics have always driven the loot system, and the loot system has always driven your motivation to play. Loot is your goal, and when that weakens, it ends up taking everything else down with it. You end up getting bored, and that is entirely Bungie's fault. Perhaps it was a lack of development time that screwed up the loot itself, but that excuse can't be applied to the true dagger in Destiny 2's heart. I still haven't told you guys what happens when you complete Phase 2 of Progression. The phase when almost all of Destiny 2's content is available and worthwhile. What you'd expect to be by far the longest phase in the game. We were wrong. Phase 2 takes about 10 hours at most, from the campaign's end to 265 takes almost no time at all. By the time I finished, I had two quests left over, no exotic quests complete, only three of the strikes done, and the vast majority of adventures and lost sectors still unexplored. And after that point, all of those activities I listed become 
become useless. Because there's a light cap on blues and legendaries that means they cannot drop any higher than around 5 levels below your current light, starting at 265. That's Adventures, Lost Sectors, Strikes, Challenges, Gunsmith, Factions, Crucible, Public Events, Enemy Chests, Region Chests, Patrols, and Quests, all utterly pointless. In 10 hours. The meat and potatoes of Destiny 2's content last 10 hours. This is an MMO. Instead of spitting out a stream of profanity, I'm instead going to tell you what you've got left after 265. There's the weeklies, public event farming, the raid, and trials. But there's actually just the weeklies and public event farming because no one's going to have a 265 in their group for the raid or trials. So the only way you can level up is the Luminous from Call to Arms, the Luminous from the Nightfall, the Luminous from Clan XP, and the Luminous from Public Event Farming, which you'll be doing anyway for that one in a lot chance of getting an exotic engram. Those are weekly activities that'll take you a day or two of two hour playtime and then farming. And it's the only way to get raid ready. So this nightmare begs two questions. Why the hell did you end phase two at 265 when you had enough content to flesh it out for far longer? And why did you make the grind to raid ready so tedious and awful? I have answers to the first question, and only speculation for the second, but it's first worth talking about clans and these tower events that suffer because of the light cap too. Factions in Destiny 2 have been reduced to a weekly event called Faction Rally. You pick a faction, and that's it. After that, you get tokens from doing Nightfalls, the Raid, Lost Sectors, and Public Events. 20 gets you an engram filled with faction loot. So effectively, the only content these rallies bring is hitting the X button and getting some armor, weapons, and shaders. And when I say weapons, I mean weapons that fall within the dominant meta. But only the future war cult auto and the hand can are even remotely desirable. Design of these weapons is nothing short of exceptional though. The wood and old metal on the dead orbit weapons is incredible. And the new monarchy shaders on their guns is utterly gorgeous. Other than that, the only interesting thing about the event is that it gives motivation to do lost sex. Still not adventures, but at least that's some content revived. And by revived, I mean turned into a boring farm, since you need to shoot supplies in the sectors to get the tokens rather than actually doing the sector. And since those supplies reset every time you load in, it becomes not just a farm, but a farm at the exact same location. The only competing method for gaining tokens is grinding public events, but that's at least 10 times less efficient. So in conclusion, Faction Rally adds about 5 cool weapons, 4 cool shaders, tries and fails to revive lost sectors, and that's about it. A huge disappointment in my eyes. And so are clans. There was a big song and dance about how good the clan features are in this game, but Bungie has pushed it to such a degree that it actually breaks the entire system. Basically, you accumulate up to 5000 XP a week for your clan, which by the way, takes a very short amount of time to do. This gets you a luminous engram, which is a very big deal, so straight away it's a big advantage to be in a clan. That 5000 XP goes towards your clan's total, and every time it fills the bar, it levels up, which gets it major in-game effects, as seen here. This is where the system starts to seem a bit dodgy. Couldn't you just join a massive clan and get all those benefits for free? Yes. On top of that, there's clan engram, so every time a fire team whose members are mostly in one clan competes in Crucible, Trials, The Raid, or The Nightfall, Every single member of the clan gets guaranteed loot from that activity. You can join a big clan and be almost guaranteed to get raid and trials loot for free every week. The only thing Bungie have to prevent this is a system whereby if you join a clan from another clan, you can't get loot for a week. This was a massive irritant for me since I just wanted to jump from my old dead clan to a new active one. My friend and I were actually the ones who got the clan their Nightfall Engram, yet I couldn't get it because of this system. It's horribly flawed, but necessary, and the root cause of that is the fact that you can get high level loot from doing nothing. Getting raid gear this way just feels wrong because the people who did the raid busted their ass for it. Rarity is a big factor in what makes loot special, and in that I think the clan system takes away more than it adds. I do think Bungie will fix it down the road, but that doesn't make its current state okay. So now that we've covered that, I'm going to frame the overall situation as cleanly and bluntly as possible. This is how few reasons you have to play Destiny 2. Strikes get tokens quickly, but the packages are useless once you've got the Nightshade and Nameless Midnight. And weapons no longer have rolls or experience, so like it or not, that's a big chunk of reasons to grind gone. The sheer number of perks on weapons has plummeted, and that often means guns are left with only one perk in a tree. This is not a perk, it's just the weapons based stat, and if you literally cannot change it. Mods attempt to make up for this, but they aren't enough, are horribly organized, and only seem like an attempt to push microtransactions with in-game effects. Gear no longer has RNG stats, that has the same effect as weapons. 
Strikes, despite them being worse than Destiny 1, consist of some of the best content in the game, but are not encouraged at all, drop no unique loot, no longer have a streak system, and can't even be selected individually. Grimoire has gone, and I'm talking about points, not the cards. World materials mean less than nothing. Zero brings only four items per week. Collectible ghosts, gone. The classic super weapon that had a huge quest to complete, like the Touch of Malice in the Outbreak Prime, gone. No, The Legend of Acherus does not count. The record book full of challenges and rewards is gone, despite it doing challenges and milestones better than Destiny 2 does now. Subclass customization is restrictive and awfully balanced. Factions mean far less, and they only come round every so often. Vanguard and Crucible bounties are gone. Weekly Crucible bounties are gone. Daybreak strikes are gone. Nightfalls are weekly and are no longer fun. Adventures and lost sectors make up the vast majority of the side stuff, yet they're utterly pointless after 265. Patrols no longer get rep, Crucible tokens don't drop enough, and packages once again have few desirable weapons than nothing. Crucible is somehow less desirable to play since the Mida multi-tool is in total dominance, skill-based matchmaking is still broken, Supremacy, a game mode about three people enjoy, is in normal rotation, yet 3 for all, 3v3, Mayhem and Capture the Flag are nowhere to be found. The competitive playlist is meaningless. Custom games has gone, meaning we only ever had it for one year of Destiny. Public event farming is boring and inefficient, there's no weekly heroic, there's no daily heroic. Meditations get you piss all. The story is better than most of Destiny 1 stuff, and it's certainly longer, but it's not enough to carry the entire game on, and it doesn't extend into quests or anything after completing the missions. You can't replay missions at will in Destiny 2 for no reason whatsoever. Despite quests being low effort shooting galleries, there's only four of them, and they give you piss all. Flashpoints only come once a week, and they're literally just more public event farming. Iron Banner is so redundant, it might as well not exist. Trials is just crucible with better loot, covered in more detail later. The raid loot is bad, and chests just give tokens. Raid encounters are not memorable, and are all flawed to their own degree apart from Callus, which is perfect. I will also cover the raid in more detail later. My problem isn't that there's no content, it's that there's no reason to do the content there is, and there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do the content there was. Why? Because Bungie decided to make the progression as quick as possible to please reviewers. Bear with me on that. In Destiny 1, I was excited every time a legendary engram dropped, because I was guaranteed to get something good. Now, they all drop at low light and mean nothing to me. They start dropping at level 20 and stop mattering at 265, 10 hours after. Exotics, yeah, I still get happy for the light boost, but they're so common and they're so boring and poorly balanced that they don't feel like exotics anymore. They're just yellows. It took me over a week to get my first exotic in Destiny, and I was ecstatic when I did. In Destiny 2, I got one four or five missions in. People don't like hard grinding like in Destiny 1, and Destiny 2 has all the content necessary to make a long progression curve entertaining. But the light cap is so low at 265 that the game could have released with less content than Destiny 1 and people still would have gotten raid ready within a week. Give me a reason to come back, Bungie. Design a few more quests, maybe give an exotic engram for every five adventures completed. Anything to make the time not feel like a total waste. Why do you think your core fan base is entering a minor rebellion? People are already getting bored, and we're three weeks in. Destiny had people grinding for months, even if that grind wasn't very fun. Now, we really are going to find out why. 1. Reviewers need to play games quickly to get their review out first. Quick progression equals quicker review and more condensed content. Quicker review and more condensed content equals happier reviewer. Happier reviewer equals another point on the verdict, and that can mean millions in sales. This is why the content drip is so well done and made to look so plentiful as you go through the campaign. Ask yourself, how many of the less positive reviews came out immediately after launch? None. Why is it that the majority of beaming, positive reviews came out instantly, while Angry Joe's skill up and myself have taken weeks to over a month? This isn't me blaming reviewers, they're just doing their job, but I don't think they know how much money is in their verdict. 2. Accessibility equals sales. If a game is streamlined, easier to pick up and understand, easier flat out to attract a more casual audience, and that's more sales. Simple as that. This casual audience isn't looking for a long progression curve or raid or trials, just a bit of fun. Which leads me into my next point. 3. If a grind turns off casual players, and they are the largest audience by a 9 to 1 margin at least, then it's best to keep that massive possible player base happy. No grind, as much condensed fun as early as possible. 4. 
Bungie made some Muppet decisions. A grind doesn't have to be in your face. A grind doesn't have to come at the cost of condensed content. A grind and fun are not opposites, and you can have both. As long as casual Colin doesn't feel pressured into grinding, then hardcore Harry can grind away minding his own business. As long as Max Light isn't something you need to do all the content and still have fun with it, a balance can be struck. What would be wrong with a daily heroic at Ikora? Something that helps, not meditations. Or a weekly heroic strike at Zavala? Or a quest to do six adventures for a powerful engram? Or a bounty bot someplace in the tower like in Destiny 1? These are the easiest, most bare-bones suggestions of a few hundred more examples. Although I suppose the 265 light cap damage is irreversible. Bungie wants to expand accessibility by going so far to make casual Colin never feel lost that they cut out half the game and replaced it with stuff that they've made redundant in the same move. And they could have avoided all of it. Casual Colin doesn't have to know that these hardcore elements exist. He doesn't have to be pressured. If the grind is kept low key, like having a raid vendor be a sweeper bot in some obscure hole. If you wondered why that was, there you go. Bungie can please both audiences, but they didn't. That's either dumbass decision making or making a conscious decision to abandon the wishes of their core fan base. And I really don't think they care. As I said, 9 to 1. Before long, that'll be 10 to none. Destiny's narrative was utterly incredible. It was exquisitely written, brilliantly creative, deeply philosophical, and all around one of the best sci-fi universes ever created. Mystery, philosophy, investment. It had it all and it was told even better. Whoever wrote some of those grimoire cards and item descriptions should be awarded. Destiny's story, however, was utter dog shit. You see, there's a big difference between lore and story. Lore is much more important than people give it credit for. It's the universe, the logic and concepts by which it operates, and the objects and characters that inhabit it. A story will have a much easier time being enjoyed if the lore is interesting. Sometimes media doesn't even need a story to have a good narrative, just some kind of porthole into its world. Dark Souls, for example. People make their living off talking about this world, because it's mysterious, because there are questions to hook us in, because it's fun to piece all the evidence together, but also because it's just well-written, interesting content. Dark Souls ticked every box, and so, in my honest opinion, did Destiny. Destiny's lore, in all seriousness, is excellent. It does everything right, and ultimately made for me the best sci-fi universe I've ever read about to date. But there's a reason Dark Souls lore is so well known, and Destiny's lore might as well have been graffitied on a mountain somewhere on fucking Mars. Dark Souls as a game made us want to learn about its universe in two ways, and Destiny barely succeeded at any of them. Those two ways are, the game asks questions, in the environment, in names, or in whatever in-game story there is, and two, the game was fun. If you associate positivity with a game, you'll naturally care more about its universe. Destiny asked plenty of questions in its environment. The tragic barren moon, Rasputin's bunkers, the Vex invasion on Venus, and of course those incredible raids. But how many will be curious enough to stop and think about those things? How many will stop caring after they realise how awful the first story was? How many will have been stopped by making the assumption that the lore cards are even in the game? How many will have even had fun with the game? after the disappointing story and lack of content, even if the gameplay is as good as it is. No one cares about Destiny's lore. That's a tragedy. It makes me upset because I might as well be the Antichrist for bringing it up online. If lore is the ingredients, then a story is the dish. A porthole into the universe, a presentation of it, with the primary function being to create an emotional connection with that universe. It isn't necessary to have a good narrative, but it is expected and it can only enhance. Destiny's story was a raw steak thrown on a broken plate with a burnt side of chips and a stock cube for sauce. It doesn't matter how good the ingredients are or were, what it is now is shit. But with Destiny 2, Bungie could try presenting their universe again without the horrible development of the first game. They had everything they had before. The same universe, the same concepts, the same writer's playground that the geniuses who wrote the lore came up with. That is why my expectations for Destiny 2's story were high. Because how can you mess it up twice? It would take the biggest group of Muppets on the planet to screw this up. And the writers at Bungie aren't Muppets, right? Everyone knows the premise of Destiny 2. Gaul attacks the tower and somehow takes it effortlessly, which believe me, we will address later. You go through the homecoming mission, which is absolutely incredible. Great combat, brilliant visuals, well-made cutscenes. You fight up to Gaul's command ship and confront him. But then he turns on this giant energy cage thing around the Traveler, severing your connection. 
He gives a really cool monologue and kicks you off the end. You're dead, right? No. I can't explain that one. You stumble your way to your ghost in this incredible rendition of The Last City, the Cabal are totally dominant. Then it's an escape montage through the mountains following this falcon. It's presented as something spiritual, a beacon of light coming to guide you home. The art here is astounding, but it's Michael Salvatore's score that stands out the most. I don't quite know how a single music piece manages to elevate a walking scene into something genuinely emotional, but if you ever needed evidence of how much music can do for your art, there you go. After that incredible escape finishes, it turns out that the Falcon isn't a being of light as this beautiful cutscene implied, it belongs to her. I know that it could still be perceived that way through themes of fate and light fighting back against dark, but um, it doesn't really work, which we'll soon see. Hawthorne introduces you to Lewis the Falcon and tells you about how she's trying to get refugees to a safe camp called the farm. The idea that she represents the humans who weren't made guardians by the Traveller who had to survive with only one life is brilliant. Perhaps this game will finally connect me to the people who inhabit this world. Problem is, Hawthorne's the most irritating character in basically ever. She's patronizing, ignorant, arrogant, and narcissistic, yet for some reason she's a main character. In every single line of dialogue she will display one of these traits. Even in the item descriptions for one of her guns makes me want to backflip off the tower railings. Oh you shoot things with it do you Hawthorne? You're such a pragmatist. I didn't want to read some cool lore, I just wanted to be patronised. Lewis is a better character than Hawthorne and he's paltry. After she's cheapened the incredible drama from the last scene, she takes you to the farm where you're going to see a shard of the Traveller. You decide you're going to go there to get your light back. And you just sort of do. Oh dear. Accepting that the target audience for this game is new players, it's far too quick to go over the biggest plot point of this story. And it's here that the entire premise falls apart. I'm going to take a break from the plot analysis to explain that. The difference in atmosphere between Destiny 1 and 2 is scale. In Destiny 1, when you landed on a planet, you felt like you were going into enemy territory. Every planet had been fully colonised by one of the villain races. The moon had been slaughtered by the hive and was now having its geometry torn apart by their magic. It was tense since the game told you about how dangerous and cold the moon had become. Venus was once a prosperous haven with one of the greatest universities in the solar system, but then the Vex appeared, slaughtered the population and began terraforming the planet into these alien structures. Each zone was constantly made out to be dangerous. You were told how many people had died, how many guardians. You were told how dangerous and terrifying the forces of the darkness were. There was even a sense of mystery. What were the Hive doing to the moon? How did the Vex just suddenly appear? You, as a player exploring these lands, felt like a small presence. The villains had scale, and the Guardians did too. This was a dystopia, a post-apocalyptic setting as the marketing had made it out to be. In Destiny 2, despite the last city having been taken and the Guardians' light severed, the forces of humanity feel more powerful than ever, and that is for many, many reasons. First being NPCs. Sloane, Devrim, and Asher all just stand in their outposts, literally meters away from tens of powerful aliens and don't seem at all bothered. They act like humanity is doing all right and continually joke around. Yet from what anyone can tell, these people are the only friendly presence on the entire planet and the aliens could walk in and execute them without a second thought. They aren't even guardians, they're just humans. And you want me to believe anyone in the game or at Bungie is taking any of these villains seriously. Secondly, the frequency at which you see are the Guardians, aka all the time, is so high that believing that humanity is in any kind of peril whatsoever is impossible. In Destiny 1, the Guardians were at full strength and you believed how dangerous the Hive or the Fallen were. Here, humanity is supposedly decimated and you're meant to be the only one with light, yet you've got bands of Guardians running around without a care in the world, casually slaughtering enemies and dance emoting. So the question is, in an MMO in which you want as much teamwork and interaction as possible, why would you make the premise about these players having been utterly destroyed and you being the only one with powers? The game breaks that immersion as soon as you land on the first planet. Thirdly, the game is easy. How do you expect me to take your premise or any villain seriously when a Guardian who's just had their light taken can slaughter hordes of enemies without a scratch? The game is ridiculously easy, you are ridiculously hard to kill, and the enemies are ridiculously easy to kill. You're almost never underleveled for a zone. In fact, halfway through the campaign, there'll be basically nothing that's higher than your power level. The game's very premise isn't just important for the story's campaign, it's the situation that you as the player are meant to feel like you're in all the time until you complete the story. It breaks that immediately, and that causes every single reference to the farm, or Hawthorne, or humanity's struggle to fail. Going back to our plot analysis, we've got our light back and now we need to restore the Vanguard by finding them and convincing them that we can fight back against Gaul. 
in case they hadn't peeked around the corner and seen 20 Guardians complete a public event in 30 seconds. You start out with Zavala, who's on Titan. He thought he could restore a fleet here, but the Hive have total dominance. You fight back against the Hive, secure a control center, and venture into the Arcology to get a CPU that'll let you decrypt some Cabal transmissions. These three missions are incredible, but that's because Bungie showcases Titan to the player here for the first time. That CPU mission is my favorite in the game because I remember the beam I had on my face when I first saw this skybox. You also get to drive a truck in this mission, but that's not particularly impressive when Bungie had also developed this. Anyway, the transmissions reveal that Gaul's got a backup plan if his invasion ever fails. A star destroyer ship known as the Almighty is shown off in one of the best cutscenes in the game. Apparently, it's pointed at our sun now, so Zavala plans to go after it with Ikora and Cade. Seems kind of unrealistic that after basically being told you're even more screwed now than you were a minute ago, Zavala is now ready to fight back. But okay. Now it's time for Cade. He's trapped in a Vex teleportation loop on Nessus, and with the help of Failsafe, you've got to get him out. Failsafe is a funny AI who switches between Amish girl and stroppy teenager between sentences. It's mostly funny because of the voice work, but it put a smile on my face nonetheless. Well, at least compared to Sloane, who helped you on Titan. I forgot to mention her because I forgot about her. Once again, the best thing about these missions is the fact that Bungie get to show off Nessus. So most of your wow moments come from seeing the sights than from actual gameplay, in stark contrast to the Taken Kings campaign. Cade comes back into the fold after you tell him that Zavala said he needed him. You know, it's funny. Cade's funny. Getting a bit repetitive now, but Cade's still okay. Finally, it's off to Ikora on Io. Oddly, Ikora's actually got the best characterization of the three by far. She admits she's scared of death now that it finally might happen to her. Her dialogue is actually really effective. The missions that follow aren't. They're boring slogs, and the reason why is pretty clear. Titan and Nessus were great because they were showing off the planets for the first time, but Io is boring and undeveloped. Again, we've gone from this to this. It's pretty awful, and so is Ashamir. He's your planet guide like Sloan and Failsafe. He's also worse than Hawthorne in pretty much every conceivable way. If she's irritating, he's a walking, talking stroke. Called Hero of the Red War, the celebrated restorer of light. After you've got Ikora back, you've got to go kill the Almighty. There's a tank mission and some general faff in an attempt to get aboard. The tank's very fun to use, but once again, that's presentation doing all the work. You can literally get out and spawn a new tank every 500 meters, which makes it so easy it practically plays itself. The Almighty mission is, in my opinion, the best mission in the game, but only because it's well presented. The sun takes up your entire skybox, and it is breathtaking. Even better, the music here is once again godly. It's edited so perfectly that the drop comes just when you enter this tube. I think this is one of the most memorable moments in Destiny history, and all you're doing is riding a tube. That's how good the score is. As for gameplay, it's just another Cabal shooting gallery. There's one section where you have to use shadows to defend yourself from the sun's radiation, but it's pretty short and very basic. You never actually destroy the Almighty either, you just shoot some heat vents and mess up its core, which somehow disables it to such a degree that it's now considered out of commission. What? I shot some heat vents and now this entire mechanolith is done for? They can't just bring it into the shop? It's ridiculous. After that, it's time to take back the city. There's a cool cutscene detailing some stuff I'd much rather actually be playing over what's lined up for us. The Cabal have shields and stuff throughout the city, and Hawthorne can temporarily bring them down. So you have to try and get past them in time, which ends up forcing you to try and run past enemies, getting you killed 9 times out of 10. Then you have to wait for the timer to finish before you can go through again. The mission gets a lot better after that, though. You climb through some brilliantly designed rooftops, fighting the Cabal and doing some pseudo-jumping puzzles. It's held up once again by how gorgeous this place looks. You make it to the Vanguard who are being torn apart, literally in Cade's case. They give you some heartwarming farewells which was actually pretty effective, but only because the game keeps you in the moment with the music and visuals. And then it's time for Gaul's boss fight. He 
He gives a ridiculous monologue about how cool he is. I think Bungie thought this would be intimidating, but it really isn't. Much more on that later. As for the fight itself, it's okay. He's stolen the Traveler's Light, which doesn't seem like it should be possible for anyone to do, much less some Cabal dickhead, but alright. That means he can use supers on you, but the fight is just an extended bullet sponge since it's so hard to die with all the free abilities. Once he's dead, he gets back up and now he's a giant cloud thing. The Traveler bursts from its cage somehow and sends a pulse of light throughout the galaxy onto some triangles who are supposed to represent the darkness. We'll have to see about that. And that is how Destiny 2 ends. So, were the writers at Bungie Muppets? Well, considering I couldn't have come up with a more ridiculous ending if I was being paid to do it, I'm going to have to go with yes. And we also have to factor in characters whose sudden turn in outlook makes no sense, characters who makes me want to uninstall the game, plot points which are overlooked, and a totally failed premise that makes you forget about the story the moment it finishes. More cutscenes and dialogue don't equal better story. It's better than Destiny 1, but compared to The Taken King, Destiny 2 is worse, and given the hype and importance of this story to prove that Destiny can have a good narrative, its incompetence is unforgivable. The thin, dumb but entertaining plot we've already looked at. But every plot is driven by its villain, and that is where the true problem lies. Here's my problem with Gaul. In the last game, Oryx, the Taken King, came into our solar system with a fleet of ships to get revenge for the death of his son, Crota, who we killed in the second raid. This was a great setup, it felt like our actions actually had consequences, and for the lore buffs, Oryx was supposed to be one of the most powerful beings in the universe. He is in literal communion with the darkness, and that's where he gets the power to take beings from. So you'd expect the story to portray that power, right? Wrong. He's supposedly here for revenge, yet the King of the Hive literally parks his ship within Saturn's rings and never moves it. He just sits there twiddling his thumbs like a donut and gets killed by one random guardian in single combat. The raid made up for it, I suppose, but this was the biggest example that the story itself, not the lore, but the presentation of it had absolutely no idea how to handle power. There were so many supposed threats that don't ever do anything. We were the aggressors 100% of the time in Destiny. Now, in Destiny 2, we shouldn't be shocked that someone actually did something for the first time since 2014, but we should be offended that it was this dickhead they chose to do it with. Gaul smashes the tower's non-existent defences in what seems like an hour, yet this guy has had no setup and is a member of one of the weakest races in Destiny lore, certainly compared to the Hive or the Vex. This just ends up taking a steaming shit over not just the lore by raising the very obvious question, if Mr. Potato Head could take the tower in minutes, why the fuck has no one else done so, but also the game's own continuity. The Taken King, The Dark Below, The House of Wolves, Rise of Iron, all these adventures with interesting, powerful, well set up villains now look ridiculous and these villains look like Muppets. I've said a hundred times before that this game is not targeted at those people who played those adventures, but breaking the believability of your own story, your own lore, feels like a knife in the gut. The first guy to have done something in Destiny is the only one who we don't know or have any interest in. Aside from the simple fact that the Cabal are not as interesting as any of the other races, Gaul has to be a genuinely intimidating villain if Destiny 2 wants to be anything of its own. Well, he isn't. His initial confrontation with you is excellent, but after that the only thing he ever does is stand in a room talking trash. On occasion throughout the story you get cutscenes with Gaul in the tower talking to the speaker. And the only thing these cutscenes show is that his one character trait is that he wants the Traveler to choose him, but that amounts to nothing. He's certainly not written poorly, and these cutscenes are entertaining, but he's absent from the plot. I did once say that a villain's function is to ask questions. That's true. To get the plot moving. But that was in a game in which the villains were an alien race with no human traits. They were nothing more than a force opposing humanity. Not interesting, but active and creating lots of questions for the plot to answer. The Red Legion raise few questions and the ones they do have ridiculous answers. A problem with having a villain as a single character is that it's harder to ask any interesting questions with it. Their characterization and motivations demand attention from the story, attention that could be spent on characterization of other characters or subplots or world building or dialogue. Some stories smartly get around this problem by having a single character represent a force. Take the Joker from The Dark Knight. He is a personification of chaos, a scary and cruel idea. Destiny 2 doesn't do this. It shies away from making Gaul an overt villain. The game describes his hardship and how he wants to be chosen by the Traveler. Why? This is a game with light and darkness. He is bad guy, we are good guy. Sympathetic villains only work when their motivations are relatable, or at least within the constraints of human morality. Gaul is just an arsehole cabal, yet they spend forever trying to make us understand him. What's the point? If Gaul was just the leader of the Red Legion and never brought up again, so the Red Legion as a force was the main villain, they would have been far more effective. Just as they were in The Taken King and Destiny 1. 
In those games, the Cabal were portrayed as all or nothing empirical war machines. Six words for attack and none for retreat. They crashed their ship into Oryx's Dreadnought and attempted to destroy it and the entire solar system as well, all to avenge their dead Primus, who Oryx took on Phobos. No, they weren't particularly interesting, but they were badass and meshed well into the Taken King's plot. Even in the awful vanilla game, their entrance was incredible. I think the Cabal have actually regressed as an enemy. No longer are they dumb but iron-willed badasses. They're now inactive, led by a Muppet, and achieve their feats not through badassery, but because the plot bent over backwards for them. When you have a villain as a force, it can be enhanced by motivations in the form of a philosophy. For example, the Hive want to kill because they believe it proves they are more deserving of existence. The Vex want a victory conditioned with the end state of the universe. If their philosophy is logical, it makes them intimidating because it challenges our own ideas. Ideas are powerful, and a force with philosophical motivation is an idea with teeth and claws. This concept can be used to enhance figureheads such as Gaul, and this same franchise has done it before. If you have a character as the main villain, then the forces they command, be them of any nature, should have the same motivations as that character. Now you can develop that character and the force at the same time, all while making the villain itself seem more powerful and intimidating, because their force is an extension of their will rather than an independent entity. Oryx and the Taken had this quality. President Snow in the capital from The Hunger Games is another excellent example. This is part of the reason why Oryx was more effective than Gaul. I'm about to make the rest apparent. The difference between Gaul and Oryx is that Oryx is cool and Gaul is not. Gaul is the first villain to have actually done something in Destiny. He took the tower, he's the first successful aggressor since launch in 2014. The first villain to have ever won a fight on screen. And then he sits in his tower and does nothing for the entire story. He is absent, his threat is a motivator for the rest of the thin plot. But since the story makes his character the main villain, having it be uninteresting is a big blow. Oryx parked his dreadnought as Saturn, killed some characters we didn't care about, and though never made a single major move, he did things. He went to Phobos and took the Cabal. You could see the effects of his wrath, the Cabal utterly decimated. You didn't smash the Taken back, you ran away in your ship. Eris, a character we know and trust, was legitimately terrified of his name. An excellent use of show don't tell. We then saw Oryx standing above his Taken. His echo haunts you across missions in the game, him directly taunting and fighting you. In one mission, you complete it, only to have Oryx pop up, cancel the timer, and send a horde of unkillable Taken against you as you desperately scramble to safety. Oryx was scary, an intimidating villain, and while the Taken King's length was nowhere near enough to justify killing him at the end, he was the only villain that the story itself, not the lore, made effective. So when Gaul shouts, I am Gaul, and repeatedly acts all cool and powerful throughout the story, I just sigh because he's not done anything to make me scared or put me in awe. If this were Oryx shouting his name, telling me about all the things he's done and seen, all the worlds he's conquered, maybe I would have been impressed. Gaul's weakness comes from his inactivity, his ignoring of Destiny's own universe and the repeated attempts to characterize him through pointless exposition when this very franchise has accomplished the same thing through infinitely more effective methods. A bad villain, an awful plot, and a failed premise combined to sully every single story beat Destiny 2 has. The game is lucky it had a cargo ship's load of cash to help it present this narrative so well I can just about call it entertaining enough to be mediocre. And even luckier, the majority of praise it receives is from people who had the worst story in recent memory to go off. Destiny's competitive multiplayer has never received much praise, and honestly, that's for good reason. Bad balancing, dumb scoring mechanics, mediocre maps, one-shotting weapons in every player's secondary slot, and unpredictable abilities that removed a large degree of skill from engagements and put victory up to lucky timing. What kept it alive and kicking was Destiny's legendary community and the loot grind that kept people playing for hours on end. Many competitive players enjoyed Destiny to bits because it was fun, not because it was actually a competitive game. Trials of Osiris and Iron Banner each attempted to bring an increased layer of depth to the Crucible, and both failed. Iron Banner relied on light level differences to work, so in year 1 you were either overpowered or underpowered, and in years 2 and 3 everyone had similar light, so the entire level differences and able thing became redundant. The loot was usually nice, but not enough for anyone to call it a success. Trials was supposed to be super competitive. You got a ticket with 9 win slots and 3 loss slots. You got some very desirable loot at various amounts of wins, but the best is if you went flawless. That's 9 wins and no losses. 
So it was very, very important to win, and therefore sweaty as hell. That's what gave it this illusion of competitiveness. In reality, the quality of games themselves were decided by the unbalanced meta and the asymmetrical map that was set on that week. Crucible was majorly flawed in pretty much every single way, and the community made their thoughts known. They wanted better balancing above all else, and I think Destiny 2 delivers that. To a degree. The gameplay changes from Destiny 1 to 2 are pretty much all for the benefit of Crucible, and that shows, in guns especially. No more one-shot kills from shotguns, fusions, and snipers until the power ammo drops. Bungie also decided to go as competitive as they could with Destiny 2's Crucible, and we're going to examine those changes right now. Destiny 2's Crucible does not allow you to choose the game mode you want to play. Instead, it streamlines every mode into two playlists. Quick Play, which is Control, Supremacy, and Clash, and Competitive, which is Countdown and Survival, the two new game modes of Destiny 2. The differences aside from the game modes are non-existent. The competitive title is meaningless, it's just different game modes even if Countdown is considered the most competitive of them all. Which really begs the question, well, it begs two questions actually, where did every other game mode go? And what was the point in focusing this Crucible on competitive if that in practice is meaningless? We'll start with the first one. Destiny 2 drops Rift, Mayhem, Salvage, Elimination, Skirmish, and Rumble for no apparent reason. Rumble, by the way, is free for all and Rift is Capture the Flag, so Destiny 2 is lacking in two major modes. Why? I genuinely don't have an answer to that. No one's missing Skirmish or Elimination, but the other four were loved modes. I just don't understand. Moving on. It's not crazy to assume that a competitive playlist would mean ranked, right? Well, apparently not. Having a ranked mode in Destiny 2's Crucible would have made it more competitive than Destiny 1's without one, even if that's for the same reason that Trials was considered competitive. People have begged for this inclusion, and I genuinely don't see why it's absent. I don't know much about video game development, but no actual content needs to be made for simple ranks. It would give a sorely needed reason to play for anyone, not just PvP players who only currently have Trials, which is only even active for half the week. I can't see how this could answer to the casual audience explanation which has worked for everything else so far. A competitive, a defensive, a multiplayer is not what that audience is after. So Bungie clearly didn't have them in mind for this part of the game. All these conflicts really confuse me. Was it underdeveloped? Cut content? It's a perplexing situation and I don't think there's much more to say on it. The gameplay in Crucible has undergone its own set of confusing changes. Destiny 2's Crucible encourages and forces in high-level play a firmly defensive playstyle in stark contrast to Destiny 1. This is true for two reasons. 1. Special weapons such as the shotgun, fusion, and sniper, while less powerful, were in constant use, and they encouraged full frontal assault. Maybe not the sniper on paper, but people snipe to look cool, so it comes around too. In Destiny 2, these weapons are in the power slot, meaning very rare use. Instead, you get two primaries, and those have always been more defensive, longer range guns. Scout and the Pulse specifically. While the slightly shorter range autos are great in 2, scouts are absolutely dominant, with the Mida multi-tool being the king. And when considering number 2, you'll see why. Team shotting. It's effectively focus firing on a single enemy with one or more teammates for a quicker kill. Now, I'm not 100% sure that smaller maps and more frequent primary engagements are entirely responsible for the surge in players making combined fire their prime tactic. It might also be a damage buff, but I am sure that the goal was to encourage team play. And it does do that, but there's such a thing as too much. What it encourages in practice is hiding around corners with your entire team, waiting for some poor sod to peek and killing him instantly in a barrage of Mida bullets. The time limit is the only thing stopping teams from gathering in groups of four and never moving from their spawn points. And maybe some prefer the defensive playstyle, but I'm sure they do not prefer the majority of their deaths being down to getting shot from two different directions. So the gunfights are more tactical, you'd expect that to give a good degree of competitiveness to the Crucible. Not really. The most frustrating problem with Destiny 2's Crucible is, unsurprisingly, supers. If Destiny 2's Crucible was about appealing to competitive players, why are supers, abilities which strip every competitive aspect from the game, still in Crucible? Not only does their overwhelming power mean they represent nothing more than effortless kills, but since everyone gets them around the same time, every game is plagued by a super spam phase, which is so far from Earth-based concepts of fun that we might as well be on IO. Getting killed to supers is not fun, it's not fair, and utterly frustrating when someone kills you with their 
super only because they panic due to losing a fight. And when an entire minute of every game is composed of getting killed to unavoidable insta-deaths, it becomes a big, big problem. Why are supers even in Crucible? Why are they allowed to exist if the game's taking a competitive focus? Bungie shot themselves in the foot with this decision. Either you remove supers and go competitive, or you keep supers and stay as you were. Supers are better here than Destiny 1's Crucible because you get a hugely helpful layer of awareness, but so is being dead. What Bungie didn't realise in their design for the Crucible is that you can be competitive and fun at the same time. Look at Titanfall, look at Overwatch or Quake. Those are fast-paced, aggressive games and some of the most popular competitive games as of now in 2017. Everything about The Guardian screams fast, action-packed play, yet so many of the changes to Destiny 2's Crucible nailed them to the ground. But gameplay is only a half of why people play Destiny. Loot is the other, and in Crucible it's worse than ever. One of the biggest problems with Destiny 2's loot is the fact that every weapon and armour piece is identical. No perk rolls, no stat rolls, and a very concise perk list compared to the first game. This isn't an issue in PvE because of how damn easy it is, but in PvP? A 1% difference in stats can be the difference between life and death. This is a big deal for Crucible players. Perhaps some people like getting the best version of every gun or armor, but what it does for everyone is reduce motivations to play. Before, an IS Luna with a god roll was effectively a different gun from an IS Luna with a bad roll, even if the two share the same name and design. It skyrocketed weapon diversity and reasons to play Crucible, some say too much. This decision has two major explanations and two major effects. Firstly, to appeal to a casual audience who, once they have a gun, expect it to be the optimal version. Perhaps this is a reasonable expectation, but it reduces the grind hugely and therefore Destiny 2's lifespan. Secondly, to increase weapon balancing in Crucible, or to at least make it easier for Bungie. This has its positives and negatives, with the positive of course being a more balanced Crucible, since the best guns are no longer acquired through godlike RNG, but the negative is everyone running around with the exact same weapons. But better balance doesn't mean as much as you'd think. Yeah, you can do okay with most guns now, but time to kill is still king in Crucible. Dominant archetypes are still dominant, and now that every gun is invariant, dominant single weapons are on top 100% of the time. The Maida multi-tool and the Uriel's Gift specifically. Once you have those weapons, which is not hard to do, you have the optimal Crucible loadout. The cause of the dominance here is a perk called High Caliber Rounds, which will always be on these guns upon acquisition. In Destiny 1, placing the best perks in the rollable slots would have helped alleviate this problem. Here, the only course of action is to nerf the perk itself, which I am certain is going to happen. Now, these guns are only as good as the other guns in its archetype, until a Destiny news outlet tells everyone what the next best optimal loadout is. There'll always be a best gun, and that isn't a flaw, but what that is will now be more obvious and easy to acquire than ever before. Is that worthwhile if people are generally on a better playing field? Destiny 2's Crucible wants to be competitive, so yes, but this is still a looter shooter, and I've already touched on how much Crucible's new focus confuses me. So also no. It's a no from me. The competitive focus has in my opinion failed. It's made the Crucible fairer, but far less fun. And if that isn't there to satisfy Crucible players and the looting and grinding aspect isn't there either, then what reason does any Crucible player have to play when the fun of the gameplay begins to wear off? Quite literally, none. Multiple influential Destiny PvP figures have already come out and said that they're bored. People who stuck with Destiny 1 for three years. I don't think this Crucible is sustainable. I don't think it's as fun as the first game. Bungie should be commended for having the balance and scoring better than ever. But that's still not great. I'm not the one to be asking for ideas on how to fix it. There are multiple great YouTubers you can check out for that, but I certainly think ranked play and letting you pick game modes would be a start. Iron Banner attempts to introduce some loot incentives, but it falls short. The armor is very nice, but that's just for cosmetics. The weapons are all bad reskins and aren't at all worth the hassle of grinding in a totally unedited crucible. There's no attempt made to differentiate Iron Banner from normal game modes. The level advantages aren't even enabled, so the event is even more redundant than it was before, and that's without considering the cap loot. As for Trials, this time it's of the Nine instead of of Osiris, and the loot is now themed around that. It looks incredible and performs even better. The new social area is called Unknown Space, and it's pretty damn incredible. Bungo knocked it out of the park with this. Other than presentation, the mode itself performs similarly to the first game. You've got better balancing with the removal of ability spam along with a new super bar and intro which reveals loadouts to all players and then cannot be changed. So it's more competitive additions to satisfy their audience, and for Trials that's actually appropriate. 
It's a damn sight more fair than Destiny 1's attempt, but since this is Destiny 2, the more competitive it tries to be, the less fun it is. From my meagre playtime, I can only say so much, but it seems every problem with Destiny 2's Crucible is amplified in Trials. Team shotting is the key to victory, which means a slow, totally defensive playstyle is absolutely necessary. Since the Mitre is so easy to get and has that insane high caliber rounds perk, it's used 35% of the time in Trials' first week. 35%! That is insane! I can't say much on Trials because not only would you have to put a gun to my head to make me play something that unfun, but there's also not a lot to talk about. It's crucible, but sweatier because there's a loot incentive. An intro sequence can't fix the problems rooted into Destiny 2's core. The Leviathan is the raid in Destiny 2, named after this gargantuan planet-consuming godship housing the Emperor of the Cabal Empire who sits on a golden throne atop a palace larger than a city. Sounds cool, right? Yeah, but that's the last you'll hear of that. The Leviathan is so separated from the rest of Destiny 2, it's funny. Of course, this is to take pressure off the new casual audience, but this is going so far that if the Earth really was flat, Bungie would have fallen off it. The Vanguard or any characters at all fail to acknowledge a ship bigger than a planet just sitting in our solar system that makes the threat of Oryx look like a rabid Care Bear in comparison. Despite Oryx and the Hive actually being more powerful than Cabal tenfold, Bungie's power scaling problem strikes again, though that's probably more a flaw of the Taken King. A bigger problem than all of that though is that the raid itself is the smallest by far, only taking you through a few tiny puzzle rooms in the most understated throne room of all time, and completely ignoring the Leviathan as a concept. A wild eating ship might make for some cool encounters, but it ends up meaning nothing. You can't see, you know, the wild eating or do anything about it. We aren't actually fighting against the Leviathan despite it being bigger than the Almighty. In fact, why are we even here? There's literally no segue into the raid. It just appeared when it was released and no one questioned it. There's nothing here to look at, to remember. No Oryx climb up from King's Fall. No incredible visuals and atmosphere in Grota's End. No mysterious mysterious timey-wimey vibes from the Vault of Glass, no big action set piece from the Wrath of the Machine. What there is, is three small puzzle rooms, connected by a pointlessly confusing hub room. We're on a ship that could eat Earth, yet we're doing three tiny puzzle rooms. It doesn't feel like a raid for that exact reason. You aren't going up against anything in the raid, you aren't progressing towards something. There's no Crota or Oryx at the end, no villain we're familiar with, no direction. Why the Leviathan is even a raid without any form of player motivation aside from loot is beyond me. The Vault of Glass also had no setup, true, but it was A, a weird hole in a mountain, not a ship bigger than Jupiter, and B, based entirely off that mystery itself. The Vex are all about time travel, only their raid could have gotten away with this. That tangent let me come up with a reason for why we've got no direction. It's because if we did, if Callus was set up, or if Gaul was the final boss, then people would feel pressured into doing the raid. If the raid was anything other than three puzzle rooms which that newer, more casual audience might be excited by, then they'd feel pressured into doing it. I believe this as much as I believe that was the reason why the raid popped up with no introduction at all, despite its supposed scale, and why the raid vendor is as hidden and swept away as it is. Bungie have bent over backwards so far to do this that they've turned their spine into a fucking VNS swirl. But it gets worse. They also tried to implement a feature called guided games that would allow less experienced players to join more experienced groups. Let me frame the situation for you. A clan of four to five players sign up as guiders. A seeker, anyone who wants to be guided, queues up to be matched with an appropriate clan. They have to spend a ticket to do so, which they get at the start of each week. As you can imagine, matchmaking times are long. Nothing wrong with that. A very small majority of clans would want to or even can take the risk of a raid taking twice as long as it usually does to run a random through it. But for the minority of clans who can, there are some issues. Guiders don't actually need to have completed the raid. A seeker might just be paired with a group of donuts who desperately needed a sixth member. Language barrier. Pretty self-explanatory. There's no region setting, so English-speaking clans are often matched with non-English-speaking seekers. This usually means matchmaking times for anyone but Spanish or English speakers are longer than the raid itself. Leavers. Some of them run out of time. Some of them rage quit. Some disconnect. Bungie can't differentiate, yet the punishment is the same for all. There has to be a fix implemented for this ASAP. Motivation. 
Why be a guider? Simple as that, there's no reason to put possibly 12 hours of your life up for no reward but an emblem and a white bar. Gratitude? What am I, a casual? But seriously, Guided Games isn't an in-game LFG, it's not even close. Why there isn't an in-game LFG, I still don't know. You still need a third party website if you don't have 5 friends who all play Destiny 2, are at around the same light level, are free for basically an entire day, and are free at the exact same time. I don't know how this approach was considered a better idea than an LFG terminal at the tower, or just a window on the director. Anything, like so many other things in the game, I just don't get it. I also don't get why Bungie decided to rotate the raid encounters on a weekly basis. It doesn't work. At all. You see, for a raid to feel like a raid, there's got to be some kind of progression. Take Vault. We start with a simple entrance minigame, then we go on to Oracles, a fairly easy encounter, then we hit Templar, a challenging boss fight, then there's a cool stealth section and a jumping puzzle to break things up, and then the daunting final boss. That format really worked it helped the setting and the feeling of a raid itself. The Leviathan has a similar format. Entrance minigame, pretty easy, then the simple pulls encounter, then the slightly harder gardens, then the significantly harder gauntlet, and then the daunting final boss. Nothing to break up those encounters, but the stealth and jumping was in the encounters themselves. That causes its own set of problems, but overall the progression is still there. That works for gameplay just fine, but on a weekly rotation, the encounters switch. Week 2 of the raid had dogs, gauntlets, pulls, aka moderate, hard, easy. Week 3 had gauntlet, pulls, dogs. Hard, easy, moderate. With progression broken, raid groups, especially LFG groups, will get stuck when the hardest puzzle is the first. People won't have learned each other's names yet, nobody's going to be warmed up. The feel of the raid pretty much disappears. Now it's time to critique each encounter individually, but I'm going to go through based on the classic order. Pools, Dogs, Gauntlet. We'll see how each one escalates in difficulty as we go through. The Royal Pools is the easiest encounter in Destiny history. That could be considered a good thing, but as we've established, that's only true on weeks when it comes first. Otherwise, it's so simple that my cat could do it, blindfolded. Let me show you, not my cat, the raid. There are four plates. I know, shocker. Which are in corners of a pool room surrounding an interior gazebo type thing which we'll just call middle. Four start on a plate, two start at middle. When you start, you get a buff called psionic protection. This stops your brain from being turned into soup, which is nice. But it runs out. So as soon as the plate platoon shoot enemies, the middle mandem will go to the center to get their protection, then run to one of the two plates on left or right, depending on what side they've been assigned. The plate guy jumps off his plate, goes to middle to refresh his buff, and runs to the other plate guy, who then runs to middle, and so on. It's very, very simple. An all-in effort to make sure everyone keeps their buff for long enough to bring down the chains in front of each plate so it locks. When all four plates are locked, you go to the middle and shoot some blueberry jelly. Maybe one or two guys will need to keep enemies off the damage dealers. It'll usually take two phases to destroy every jar. And then you're done. This was a combat-focused encounter. You just shoot a lot of stuff. The only mechanic is dealt with by running to middle and then to the opposite plates, which I have to reinforce, my cat could do. There's no boss, no auxiliary white mechanic, just some jars and four plates. It honestly feels like an introductory encounter, like Totems from King's Fall. It's almost a stretch to even call it an encounter. Maybe if there was some shred of spectacle to the fight, the weak mechanics could slide, but there isn't. You're shooting jars of goo in a tiny swimming pool. Why? And even if the encounter order was concrete, it would still be remarkably unremarkable. Moving on to the gardens. The Pleasure Gardens is ironically named because the last thing you'll be experiencing in this encounter is pleasure. And that's not because there's so much communication and teamwork required, it's because it's a buggy piece of crap. Let me explain the premise of the encounter to you. There's a maze-like garden in which spore fruits are contained. Four people will work their way to each while avoiding patrolling dogs. Two people will pick up prison weapons from the safe room at the back and blast the spores when all four maze crawlers have made it to one. The prison patrol can only use the weapon when standing in a light beam, and they also have to worry about guiding the crawlers through the garden since they have a bird's eye view, and shoot beast masters who direct the dogs to the crawlers. Once the timer runs out, or a crawler is spotted by a dog, all six of you dive in and begin damaging them. Your team's damage is dependent on how much spore the crawlers gathered. This damage phase only lasts for so long, so after about 25 seconds or so, you dash back to the safe room as the door is slowly closed. Three phases is usually how long it takes to kill all six dogs, but doing it in one is pretty easy if you've got an experienced group. Complicated on paper, but very easy to remember once you've got it down. The difficulty, as with every encounter, comes from the number of things you can screw up. A crawler gets spotted too early, you fail to damage the dogs equally, the guider gives poor directions, the guider doesn't kill beastmasters, the game teleports the dogs around a corner, or the dogs spot guiders which they aren't supposed to do. 
The number of things that can go wrong usually decides the difficulty of an encounter, but the quality of an encounter is, along with fun factor, decided by how much control players have over those things going wrong. Dogs can and will lag out. They can and will spot guiders and the guiders have to do 90% of the work while the crawlers just need the incredibly refined skill of being able to listen to instructions. It might as well just be those two up top with the prison playing the raid, because they're responsible for just about everything. This is a problem because there's far too much stress on the guiders, meaning no one wants to be a guider. It's an unpolished and in my opinion utterly unfun encounter. The best thing about it is the atmosphere. Now it's onto the gauntlet. The gauntlet is a very creative puzzle. It's like Oryx, but without Oryx. Or any boss, actually. Your only goal is to get balls of light into this centerpiece. And to do that, you'll need to guide two runners through a ring divided up by four gates, each with nine hoops. A runner will call out what row the red hoop is on, and two shooters will shoot every arrow that isn't what they called. So if the hoop's on the medium row, the shooters will fire at top and bottom. Which is harder than it seems. There are four plates next to four gates. Every shooter takes a plate. They pair up, so sun plate will help beast plate, and chalice plate will help axe plate. This means every plate will always have two shooters. Once a runner passes through a gate, the corresponding shooter will have to dive off their plate, punch a scion, and jump back on. This is just busy work so the shooters don't get too bored. Every run will have three hoops for each runner. When they both finish, they run to the centerpiece and smash their balls into the cups, like a hyper-aggressive sperm donation. Three runs will fill up the centerpiece, which will then give out six balls for all your team. Everyone is now a runner and four hoops are activated, so only four of you can get a hoop at a time. If you miss two in a row, you die. Four people need to make it. That requires a lot of on-the-spot communication. You need to call out what hoop you're going for to not make sure two people go for the same one. You can either alternate between two groups of three getting a hoop, or having four get one every time and two people just die. It's incredibly difficult to do if you haven't planned extensively and practiced. It's a challenge in communication, and that really means it's about luck when it comes to the LFG. Without six clear-speaking people who all agree on strategy, this part is pretty much a guaranteed wipe the first couple times. I don't like that. I don't think an encounter should rely on nothing but communication, because that means one weak link can break the whole chain. It makes the encounter won or lost in group finding, not in the game itself. Destiny is a first-person shooter, it's been showered in praise for its gunplay since the closed beta in 2014. People like shooting stuff. It's what makes the game fun. The gauntlet isn't about shooting stuff, it's about killing a few enemies at the start, then sitting on your plate for five minutes waiting for call out so you can shoot an arrow. Being a shooter couldn't be more mundane. It's borderline lethargic, which makes the gauntlet fall even further apart. If the game isn't keeping you engaged, communication is going to fail. One bad call out can snowball into a wipe, and then you have to spend another 20 minutes two steps from comatose once again. Perhaps visuals or atmosphere could have helped, but you are literally staring at arrows for 20 minutes at a time. It's boring to play, boring to look at, and has its success measured on how quick your teammates are, not on how good your teammates are. Maybe this would work in a team building exercise, but not in Destiny 2. With no outstanding encounter, the last hope for this raid is Callus. Emperor Callus is the only encounter in the raid that I find enjoyable, and that's for good reason. As final bosses go, this guy is one of, if not the best. Once again, we're immersed in hugely underplayed visuals for seemingly no reason, because the throne room of the Cabal Empire would of course be about the size of a studio apartment. But it's all to dress up the real focus of the room, the plates, of which there are not three, not five, but four. You don't need to stand on them yet, instead assign three people to the throne room and another three to the void, groups you'll need to split into after Callus claps his hands once you've killed enough adds. Scions will also appear here, but for some reason you aren't meant to kill them. I don't know if Bungie did this to throw people off or what. Anyway, Callus's clap sends the entire raid team into the void. There'll be three balls of light. Throne team each grab one, while void team aligns themselves from left to right, making sure when they get sucked forward they won't be propelled into the air by little ramps on the track. At this point, symbols will appear on Callus's head, but every member of the void team will get a different one. Left calls out first, then mid, then right. Whatever symbol is not called out is the one signalling the plate upon which the scion you need to kill stands. So if the callouts go sun, beast, chalice, you punch axes. Throne team will also have to deal with a buttload of enemies, so they're under as much pressure as the void team, who now get sucked forward and have to shoot some floating and normal scions as quickly as possible at risk of a wipe. This repeats until the void team make it to the end of the track. Callus now starts shooting skulls out of his mouth. 
I can't explain that one. Void Team shoot the skulls, with each one a stack of the buff called Force of Will is granted to each player. Meanwhile, in the throne room, Kallus prepares a wipe attack. So to optimise for time killing skulls, the throne team cut stopping Kallus' attack as close as possible. After his attack is stopped, balls appear and the void team jump back into the throne room. Now it's time for the part we've all been waiting for. It's now time to jump on the plates. All six players go on the same plate and damage Kallus using weapons like Merciless, Cold Heart and Sweet Business. Kallus will prepare an explosion attack which signals it's time to move on to the next play. Once you've taken a third of his health, he reveals himself to be a robot and you shoot his chest. The only other thing that changes is that he has a laser attack over an explosion. And the void track has a few holes in it. With persistence, communication and effort, Kallus dies. And I honestly can't think of anything to criticise. Skill is prioritised over communication, but communication still plays a big part. Each roll is as hard as every other, and they all keep you engaged. The mechanics are clean and that results in a very fun fight. One of the best Destiny has ever seen, actually. Perhaps it's only the theatrics that bring it down. Still, Kallus does not feel like a final boss, much less anything resembling the head of the Cabal Empire on a ship bigger than a planet. The only time the Leviathan impresses as far as spectacle is concerned is after Kallus, when you descend to receive your loot. Kallus has thousands of robots just like the one you fought. He tells you to seek him out if you wish to grow fat from strength. Whether or not it's okay to make the final boss of a raid just a joke is something up for debate. And with that, the raid is over. But we haven't looked at the loot. You'd expect the best looking, best performing gear and weapons in the game, right? Well, that expectation rings false in two ways. The raid armor looks pretty good, nothing remarkable, certainly a step down from every other raid apart from Wrath, but solid. It performs very oddly though, as in it doesn't. All the armor in Destiny 2 is a massive letdown thanks to the lack of perks and lackluster designs, but surely the raid gear should have something to give it an edge over everything else. The only benefit to getting it is the light level. It's a huge disappointment. Weapons on the other hand fare much better. They are actually good for the most part, and they look utterly incredible. Nothing like Crota or Oryx, but certainly better than Vault and Wrath. And the names, they're so cool. Midnight Coup, Alone as a God, Ghost Primus. Again, nothing on the tier of Abyss Defiant, but still really good. So raid weapons are all right, but armor sucks. Not a good show. That's only the first way loot disappoints though. The other is simple. You'd expect some of the best looking and performing guns and gear in the game, right? As in you'd actually expect there to be some. Well, I can vouch for their existence, but they drop incredibly rarely. Maybe one or two pieces per raid. That's just irritating. The other way you get raid loot is through tokens. Every encounter drops some, and the three chests you get in the underbelly, which by the way is very cool, drop only them. 20 gets you one piece of loot at Benedict the Sweeper Bot in the tower. Why though? Why not just have every encounter drop something? And if you don't want to give out too much raid gear, then exotics or highlight legendaries would be just as good. The chests only dropping tokens is utterly ridiculous. I don't get how this loot system has managed to go backwards from every other raid. Oryx had tokens, but not the sacrifice of real loot, and they just gave you an extra from the final chest instead of at a sweeper bot. Loot is a massive disappointment in my opinion, and if the sole reason to do the raid isn't that great, and the raid itself isn't that great, then why do the raid? Luminous engrams and trials can boost your light, and the only reason you'd ever want high light is so you can perform better in endgame activities, of which only the raid and the prestige nightfall exist. Every raid before has had this problem, but every raid before was fun and they had stuff like the Touch of Malice in Outbreak Prime. Now we've just got the Legend of Acrius, which is massively underwhelming. And there was Trials, which had level advantages enabled. The only reason to boost your light is to get ready for the Prestige Raid, a version in which encounters are slightly more difficult and loot is slightly more cool. But if the prestige armor and weapons don't massively improve, then that's Destiny's raiding scene down the drain until the next one launches. That's Destiny's endgame, dead. Destiny 2's problem is the 2, because it can't just be a pretty good game anymore. You could buy Pablo Escobar's entire drug cartel for the amount of money poured into this franchise. Yet somehow, in almost every category, Destiny 2 regresses from Destiny 1. And that might seem extreme, but let me explain myself. It shocks me when I look back at so many positive reviews of the game from people who are more than skeptical of the first one who have now come round and said that Destiny 2 fixes all of one's problems. The grind is more forgiving, the graphics are great, there's so much content and it's also rewarding and the story is good now. It was all some spin on this. I watched these reviews when I just finished Titan in the story, and you know what? 
I agreed with every single one of them. I honestly thought the story was good. I honestly thought there was enough content to keep me going for weeks, months, because those first eight hours or so are really that good. And based on footage and release times, I don't think many of those reviewers played past 265 Lite. Some of this is down to reviews only playing for 10 hours or so, but I also think a lot comes from the fact that no one had played Taken King. That expansion had the best story, the best mission design, the best cutscenes, the best raid, the best grind, the best exotics, the best strikes by a mile, and worked equally for casual and hardcore players. The Taken King was, in my opinion, better than Destiny 2, though smaller in scale and budget. So when I see reviewers write that Destiny 2 fixes all of Destiny 1's flaws, I sigh because this game is not a step forward. They're comparing Destiny 2 Year 1 to Destiny 1 Year 1. Wrong. We should be comparing Destiny 2 to whichever year of Destiny 1 was the best, if this is a sequel. People have forgotten The Taken King because so few played it. Bungie have forgotten it because people who did play it are not their target audience. Destiny 2 is not only worse than The Taken King, but also conflicted to a frankly shocking degree. Its gameplay only benefits its PvP, which wanted to take a competitive focus this time round. Yet it's still not competitive, less fun from my perspective, and lacks features from Destiny 1, whose removal are nothing but perplexing, prime among them being a rewarding loot grind. These gameplay changes hurt PvE as they conflict with the enemy design which remains almost the exact same from Destiny 1. The story is flashier, yet insulting to Destiny's very own lore and plot from previous content. In fact, even with all the graphics and music, I don't think it even once reaches the heights the Taken King's art did with Oryx's entrance. The campaign's mission design is so easy and invariant that it bores returning players from Destiny 1 and regresses from the awesome variety we saw in the Taken King. There's a healthy amount of side content, but much of it is fatally flawed. Strikes especially. But there was enough to flesh out a much longer loot progression. Instead, the 265 cap ends up failing the player and all of the people at Bungie who must have worked their asses off developing it. On top of that, troves of content that could have come back from Destiny 1 is missing for no obvious reason. Loot itself is bland and unrewarding, exotics worst of all. The campaign gives away some of the most desirable in the game, cheapening them along with their not rarity to an almost obsessing degree. The exotic quests are awful compared to the highly entertaining multi-stage quests with actual content like the Taken King and Rise of Iron, and the weapons chosen to have quests were criminally misguided, with the Stern being useless, the Rat King being offensively useless, and the Mida breaking Crucible. Your primary motivation to play is loot, yet that loot is worse than what we had in the last game. From both a power and presentation standpoint, the raid is poorly designed and mysteriously lacks the incredible presentation the rest of the game had. The loot there is also not enough to push the player through it, when this same franchise had King's Fall and Crota's End with some of the coolest loot I've ever seen seen in gaming. Guided games failed miserably due to what I can only assume was a lack of development time. Maybe this will be fixed in patches, but how many of the people who wanted to be guided through the raid or the nightfall now will still be here when that comes to pass? Eververse is still here without explanation and now has in-game effects, which when combined with the offensive shader system becomes nothing more than a malignant tumour. There's no point in going on. Every major facet of the game was done better in The Taken King, even with its infinitely smaller scope and budget. I've explained my reasons why I think that is, and there's a boatload of more minor points that I haven't even touched on to keep the video at two hours. Stuff like no stats on classes, no ammo synthesis, no EXP weapon progression. Destiny is no longer a highly accessible MMO FPS, rather an FPS with loot elements, and I think they got away with it. That is where my Destiny 2 critique ends. If you enjoyed this video, I have tons more like it. Titanfall 2, Battlefield 1, Dark Souls 3, and my ongoing years later series on the Crisis games. I've got a list of ideas longer than the BBC's Sex Offenders registry, so be on the lookout for those. Thanks for watching, everyone.